Western Louisiana Raging Cajuns take on the Texas A&M Aggies. Hello again, everybody. Along with Artie Gigantino, I'm Ron Thulin. And considering what happened last year, Artie, not much talk about revenge as far as Texas A&M is concerned. What there is talk about is the fact R.C. Slocum has somewhat changed his offense. Yes, he has. And what he has right now is a two-quarterback system. It's not a quarterback controversy, as a lot of people would let it to believe. It is a two-quarterback system. Brandon Stewart is the leader. He's the starter. He brings athleticism and experience to this two-fold system. The backup is Randy McCown. He brings a little bit more of an eagerness, and it brings a stronger arm. Both quarterbacks will play today. The coaches alternate these two people based on game feel, Ron. Well, whether or not USL can stop Texas A&M remains to be seen, but for USL on offense, the key is going to be a guy who's probably the best unknown receiver in college football. He started out as a ball boy. Yeah, Brandon Stokely's also the coach's son. He's an amazing guy that does a lot of things for this USL offense. The only problem is, Ron, who's going to throw him the football? Starting quarterback Barton Foles was injured last week. This this week's starters, Brian Sonye, he's only thrown 19 passes this year, four completions, and two interceptions. It might be a tough go for this USL offense today. Well, history doesn't bode well for USL, and his tenure as head coach, AM head coach R.C. Slocum, 19-0 versus non-conference opponents at home. We'll step aside. The coaches are ready. The players are ready. The Aggies and the Raging Cajuns next. Of today's matchup against Southwestern Louisiana is not a revenge game for Texas A&M. They're sure not saying much about that, but you know one thing, R.C. Slocum, the Aggies head coach, has shown his team this cover. It's the cover of the USL Media Guide, and it's plain and simple. It reads, USL 29, Texas A&M 22, a picture of last year's stunning upset. The Aggies say this is not a revenge game, but you know one thing, R.C. Slocum is letting his team know, never underestimate your opponent. Up next, it's the kickoff between Texas A&M and Southwestern Louisiana. Stay tuned. Toss, they have elected to receive. Kyle Bryant set to kick it away for Texas A&M. Willie Terrell and Mike Ellis back to receive it for the Raging Cajuns. Not a very good kick. It's going to be Terrell. He fumbles it. He'll pick it up at the three. Straight up the middle, and he is going to be dumped hard at about the 12. Michael Jamison. A freshman from Colleen, Texas on the stop. And the quarterback, as we mentioned at the top of the show for USL, it is a question mark. Brian Sonier was expected to start this year. He was a backup for the last two years, but he injured an elbow. He had shoulder surgery. And then he started the year as the backup again. And he's got to go into this game today, Ron, and keep his composure and not make the big mistake to put the USL offense in a hole. Sonier about six foot. 189 pounds, he's a junior. Three wide receivers, Stokely Freeman and Franco Smith, one in the backfield. Sonia hands it off on the inside. Nothing doing for the freshman Elvis Joseph. Let's take a look at the offensive line, first of all, for USL. And the big guy is going to be Anthony Clement in left tackle. He is big at 6'8", 349 pounds. And in the halfback, Brandon Stokely, two receptions away from becoming USL's all-time leading receiver. He already holds every other record in USL history as far as pass receptions. Second down, a loss of a yard. We'll call it 11. And the wrecking crew defense right there. You know, much has been written about the new defensive alignment, but that was a blitz already by new defensive coordinator Mike Hankowitz. Let's take a look at the defensive line now for Texas A&M. Brad Crowley, a young defensive line, but he is the senior and he is the basis of this defense. And in linebackers, Dat Win, he is intense. He is the heart and soul of the Texas A&M defenders. And in the secondary, Cedric Curry moved from safety to cornerback. We'll keep an eye on him. Joseph and Boudreaux in the backfield, third down and 11. Sonia is going to put it up across the middle. The pass is tipped incomplete. Trent Driver got a hand on it, and USL is going to be forced to punt. You know, going into this game, Ron, USL's had a lot of problems on third down. They're only 20%. And I tell you, Driver does a nice job of reacting to that, but he's going to get some chiding by his teammates because he probably should have caught that. Well, Chris Shaw is set to kick it away. He is standing in his end zone. 
Not a very good kick, end over end. a and is just going to let it bounce. And it'll be down at the 41-yard line of Texas A&M, and that's where the Aggies will begin their first possession of the football game. Three and out for USL. Now, one thing that Texas A&M likes to do is they like to start on defense. USL almost played into their hands. Well, they did play into their hands. R.C. Slocum told us yesterday that if he had won the toss, he was going to defer because what he likes to do, he likes to take the wind and play defense first and hopefully pin the opponent's offense down in the loud part of the stadium. So strategy didn't work that time for R.C., but it played into his hands. Well, you saw the numbers on Brandon Stewart, who has been granted another year of eligibility. He learned that in April. That was good news for this young man. And he's watching the play at the line of scrimmage. Three-step drop, quick out, passes complete to the 48-yard line. Aaron Oliver, son of Al Oliver, former Major League Baseball player. As we take a look at the offensive line, Samisi Haimuli, the Tongan at right guard. He is a big one. He is experienced, and he is good. Sir Parker, there were thoughts of Sir Parker transferring to USC. He talked to R.C. Slocum a couple of times. Decided not to, came back 13 pounds stronger, and he is in the backfield. Potent backfield. Pickup of seven on the play, sets up the second and three for Texas A&M. Stewart, flag is thrown. He's going to have This is where he got in trouble last year, but the difference is this year already, he ate the ball. Last year, he tried to force something. One of the things that the coaching staff really tried to emphasize with Brandon this year is to make better decisions. That time, it was a good decision, and it looks like it's going to be offsides against USL. You're exactly right. John Laurie, our referee this afternoon. Look at the top part of your screen here. You'll be able to see maybe the offsides. There it is. Randy Young, who is starting this week for the first time, a junior, six foot, 262 pounds, a little over anxious. But again, one of the things that AM does, they have a non rhythmic cadence, Ron, which tries to draw defensive linemen offsides. Now that'll give AM a first and 10. We're about two and a half minutes here in a quarter number one. Ball on USL's 47 yard line. Stewart and McGowan, as already mentioned at the top of the show, will alternate a quarterback to feel things for the coaches. Stewart, three-step drop, passes complete to Sir Parker. Look out. One move, one man to beat. Down to the 12-yard line for Sir Parker. Got him. That is his third reception of the year. His longest coming up to that play was 13 yards. He beats that handily. One of the new formations that Texas A&M is employing this year is Sir Parker in motion and sometimes lining up as a wide receiver, sometimes motioning out to a wide receiver. That time they throw him a quick pass and he does a wonderful job, Ron, of running after the catch, which is something that the coaching staff has really emphasized with this team. And for USL, let's take a look at their defensive line, and this has been a problem. They are beat up, they are young, and they are not very big, but Shannon Jeffries is outweighed, or their line is outweighed by an average of 40 pounds. Linebacker Chucky Woodall, the leading tackler of this USL defense, and Charles Johnson in the secondary, he is the second leading tackler. Eight of the nine top tacklers are either in the linebacking core or, or in the secondary for USL. A&M keeps it on the ground, down to the three. It is Dante Hall the sophomore out of Houston, Texas. You know, he comes into this game with an unbelievable 15-yard average. He had two touchdowns last week against Sam Houston, and he is different than Sir Parker. He's more of a Barry Sanders-type guy. He is slow to the ground, but what he can do when he gets the ball, he can turn up the field, lower his shoulders, and pick up more positive yardage. He breaks a lot of tackles. He's a powerful guy at 190 pounds. Look for him to have a big year this year. The numbers on him last year for Dante Hall. Freshman All-American was all Big 12 in a couple of categories. A&M, second down and one. Ball is on the three-yard line. Mark Broyles is the fullback. Some movement. A&M straight ahead, down to the one. That'll be good for the first down. We do have a penalty flag thrown. Tiki Hardiman on the carry. A&M wanted to establish the run. I think they have done that, but that little three-step drop and out by Brandon Stewart has sort of set up everything. Same guy who jumped before, Randy Young, jumps again. Well, that's what happens. Here he is right there. That's what happens with young guys. They have their adrenaline pumping. They're a little over-anxious. 
Penalty empty for First and goal. And sometimes they jump off sides, but Hill, he's just got to calm down a little bit because he doesn't want to hurt his team in critical situations. Now the numbers on Randy Young, only six foot, but he is 262 pounds, and now it is first and goal from about the half yard line. Hardiman, Broyles, and Dante Hall in the backfield. Touchdown, AM. the tradition goes you get a kiss if AM scores one of the great traditions in college football I wish <laughs> I went to school here this game could turn into an x-rated movie though if that tradition continues today Stewart on the sneak didn't take AM long 1136 left in the first quarter and the Aggies are on the board Kyle Bryant will attempt the extra point you know AM they worked on that series of plays yesterday, and they scored against air yesterday also, Ron. Kyle Bryant, who the legend says is named after this field, splits the uprights. Brandon Stewart and company, good drive to open things up. They lead 7-0. Kyle Bryant's kick's going to be out of bounds. And it goes into the end zone. That'll be a touchback. Let's take a look at our Mazda scoring drive for Texas A&M. Nelson Stokely, the head coach of USL, says, we can't afford to give up the big plays. But he did. Sir Parker's 35-yard reception set up that 59-yard drive. And that couldn't have been scripted better by the A&M coaches. And they are not going to try to take a lot of chances today. They are going to be sound. They are going to be safe. They're going to throw the ball a little bit. But they really want to run the football because they know to win the Big 12 championship, they're going to have to run the football effectively. USL, seven starters returning on offense from last year's team, but five of those are on the front line. This time they're going with three wide receivers again. Joseph in the backfield by himself, and he will keep it. Up to about the 23-yard line, not much there. Texas A&M's offensive line did the job in that drive. Watch the surge here by these guys up front. They do a great job of coming off the ball, keeping their feet moving, and allowing Stewart to get into the end zone. Quarterback sneaks are not that easy. People always say, oh, all the quarterback's got to do is fall forward. That line still has to do a great job on quarterback sneaks. Pickup of two for USL, second and eight. Sonia goes upstairs, pass is complete. Not much on it as Brian Gassaway comes up with his second reception of the year. Pickup of two. Well, well, the keys to victory. What USL has got to do today, they've got to take some chances and hopefully make some big plays. Their defense has got to force Texas A&M to throw. A&M cannot run for 300 yards today on them, and they can't beat themselves by giving opportunities to A&M by fumbles or penalties. Sean Horn, Chris Dury into the A&M lineup as USL keeps it on the ground. Joseph trying to get up to the 30, and he is going to be stopped three yards short. That went on the tackle. He was right in the middle of things, and you will see number nine a lot this afternoon. Well, he is one of the best linebackers in the United States, and he's got a great story to him. But the best story about him, according to R.C. Slocum, he's a productive football player that makes a lot of plays, and he is the heart and soul of this new A&M defense. Well, that wins, R.C. Slocum says, reminds him a little bit of Ed Simonini. Not very big. Simonini, if you remember, played about 10, 11 years in the NFL. Chris Shaw's kick, not a very good one again. Hall's going to be able to return it, starting at the 38. He's got some daylight. Penalty flag has been thrown as Hall gets into USL territory, but we do have a penalty. 37-yard kick, 16 on the return, but there was probably a bad block. It was a clipping block, I believe, or someone pushing someone from behind. That's one of the problems with punt returns, Ron. There always seems to be a penalty because of the angles that are created. And a guy like Hall can make things happen on his own. Well, the Aggies will begin first down. Ball will be on about the 35-yard line. We'll return to Kyle Field after this word from Dr. Pepper and your local Dr. Pepper bottler. First drive, and they lead it by a touchdown. 934 left in the first. Well, the AM the two quarterback six system but it was not a hard decision to make for rc slocum on a given player given series of down 
Uh, one time one of them's a little better, and the other time the other's a little better. So we said, you know, I don't want to flip a coin here and say this guy is the guy. And so let's do this. Let's play until one of them uh, distinguishes himself as clearly the better quarterback. Let's play both of them. And if it doesn't happen that one of them does that, then let's keep getting both of them better and we'll have us two good quarterbacks. So that's what we're doing. And so far it has been successful. Stewart still in the lineup. Play action pass. He's going for the home run ball. He's got a man and it's going to be incomplete. Penalty flag is thrown. Garrett Johnson, probably their best cover guy at corner, does not like it. Well, it was man to man, and it looks like he pushed off when he turned around to look for the ball. But Texas A&M is going for the gusto on first down by throwing the ball deep. Intended for Leroy Hodge, probably their best receiver's got great hands. Pass interference, defense, 15 yards, first down. 15 yard penalty, and USL's margin of error in this game already realistically is very, very small. They gave up the big play to Sir Parker, now they give up this penalty. They can't afford to do this. Well, that's what I was talking about before by not giving them opportunities. And again, playing man to man is difficult sometimes because the frequency of pass interference is greater. But he did push. Johnson did push with his right arm. But I'll tell you, it's better to push and get a 15 yard penalty or a pass interference penalty than give up a touchdown. That's one of those good fouls. Yeah. A&M, three wide receivers, one of their multiple packages. Stewart swings it out of the flat, wide open. A lot of room to run, crossing the 40 down to the 35-yard line. Again, it is Sir Parker. He had two receptions last or two weeks ago against Sam Houston. He's got a couple this afternoon. Get the ball to Sir Parker as many different ways as you possibly can. That is a characteristic this year of the A&M offense. And you're going to see him line up at wide receiver, run the ball out of the backfield, catch the ball out of the backfield. Yep. He's a productive man, Ron. That was really a lateral. They're going to count that as a rush because he was behind Stewart when that ball was released. But it is first and 10, ball on the 35 for A&M. Right up the middle for Tiki Hardeman, and he finds some running room inside the 30, down to about the 27-yard line. Tiki Hardeman, the junior out of Houston, Texas, he's a tail. He has tailback running skills. They're going to move him all over the place. You know, Hardeman is a tailback with a, in a fullback body, but you're going to see our man Haimuli pull and trap on that. A big play by the big Tongan offensive guard. He sprung it. <laughs> Samisi Haimuli, who wears lava lavas. Where I grew up, they call them skirts. But I'm not going to tell him that. Stewart, little uh, problem with the exchange. We do have a penalty flag thrown. You know, it looked again like Randy Young jumped off sides. And, you know, he is just, like I said before, he's got to settle down. That's 15 yards already against him in penalties. And you know it's him because he's look looking at the official there. <laughs> Offside, defense. You're right. Penalty. Good call, coach. First down. That'll give A&M yet another first down. Again, here he is. He's going to jump. And what he's doing, Ron, he is not watching the football. He is listening to the cadence as opposed to watching the football out of the corner of his eyes. And again, it's something that young players don't do all the time. Oh, Randy Young has been taken out of the game by Coach Nelson Stokely, beginning his 12th year. Seven wins away from becoming the all-time winningest coach in USL history. Dante Hall and Hardeman in the backfield. A couple of H-bombs. Hall makes his way up to about the 15-yard line. Pickup of seven on the play before Daryl Albert made the stop. When you watch Hall run the football, he zigzags. You know, somebody asked him about that the other day, and he said, I am not a zigzag runner. He said, I'm a zig, zig, zig runner. And that's what he is. He stops on a dime and gets up the field. That is as much as Barry Sanders as I've seen in college in a long time, Ron. He's got great balance. Second and four, ball on the 16. Stewart changing the play. Royals in motion, and Brandon's going to call a timeout. 7.49 left in quarter number one. The Aggies are moving again. They already have the lead. Pass is complete to Broyles. He makes his way down to the two. No, incomplete. And USL has a player down. 
It looks like Broyles started to run to the end zone before he had control of the football. And that's what happens to fullbacks a lot because people don't throw him the football very much. They have a tendency to catch the ball but start to run before they have it under control. Jack Cooper is the player hurt, the right defensive end. Broyles is in great shape, and it's a good pass by Stewart, but you got to go catch the ball, don't bobble it, tuck it in, and then get into the end zone because the coaches aren't going to throw you another pass. Stewart takes a pretty good shot there that time. Dwayne Viator. By Dwayne Viator, who was a linebacker who was blitzing on that. Yeah, they're working on the right leg of Jacko Cooper, the junior out of Mississippi. You know, one of the unknown factors in this game, Ron, is the fact that USL only brought 20 or 65 players. They only suited up 65 players today. A&M's got 100 guys suited up. The other factor is that USL was out there for 20 minutes in pregame warm-up. Texas A&M only warmed up for 10 minutes. R.C. Slocum said he learned his lesson a couple of years ago. Sometimes when it's too hot, he doesn't like to warm his football team up. In fact, he keeps them in the weight room, which is 23,000 square feet. He likes to have them warm up in there rather than out here in the hot sun. There is head coach R.C. Slocum in his ninth year as head coach. 25th year here at Texas A&M in his third stint here at A&M. First college job for Kansas State back in 1970. Well, that's good news to see Jacko Cooper up walking off the field under his own power. A&M second down and goal. Ball is sitting on the six-yard line. One of the things that can happen to USL today is to get beat up physically and to lose players. Not only because they've already been injured, and not only because they only have 65 guys, but they have players with limited experience. And they're all already beat up. They can't afford to lose anybody else. Stewart in the eye formation. They're gonna try the right side. The hole is there, down to the two yard line. Tiki Hardeman. You talk about this backfield. Missouri also four 500-plus yard rushers. A&M would have had four back this year. But unfortunately, Eric Bernard hurt his knee early on in fall practice. He is out for the year, but you still have a very potent rushing game. Yes, you do. And Bernard unbelievably got hurt in a non-contact drill on grass. He just fell and tore his ACL. This is an outstanding group of backs at this Texas A&M backfield. How about 27 of the 39 offensive touchdowns? Keep it on the ground. It's going to be a walk in the park. A&M, two for two. Dante Hall takes it in. A&M scored on eight consecutive possessions against Sam Houston a couple of weeks ago. They're two for two this afternoon. Well, last week, they, they ended up with 567 yards of total offense on only 65 plays, and they rushed for 309 yards. So they are going to establish the run. That's what they want to do this year in the beginning of this game. The extra point is good. 639 left to play in quarter number one. Kyle Bryant makes it a 14-0 game as Dante Hall takes it in for his first score of the afternoon. His fourth or his uh, third touchdown of the year. Dante Hall is the type of runner that you want to give him the ball in the backfield and allow him to pick his hole. And he does an excellent job of following his block. And number 20, Hardman that time, threw a block that sprung him into the end zone. You love to see that, Ron. Backs blocking for other backs. Now let's head down to the sideline. Jim Knox is prowling around. He has an update on the USL team. Jim? Okay, Ron, Jacko Cooper will be okay. He just got cut on the knee. Nothing serious. He said he's going to be all right. That's what the trainers say. He's going to be back in the action sometime today. Cut on the knee. The grass didn't do it. This is the only school in the state of Texas with Texas bred grass. And when you and I walked on it, it's like a golf course down there. It's absolutely beautiful. And R.C. Slocum made the decision a couple of years ago, two years ago, in fact, to go from artificial turf to grass because he felt that it was a recruiting disadvantage, number one. But number two, the injury factor was higher on AstroTurf. He did a survey. 17 of the top 20 schools in the country have natural grass. Their baseball field is spectacular. Their football field is spectacular. And the people here at AM saying their groundskeeper, he lives, eats, and breathes, making sure this is the best-looking field around. And he is very successful at it. 
Bryant kicks it away. Out of the end zone, USL will begin on their own 20. Well, last week against Texas Tech, there was one bright spot for USL, and it was that young man right there, the freshman, Elvis Joseph, number three, 2,000 yards rushing in high school. He had a touchdown last week, and it was a dandy. And he had 30 touchdowns his senior year in high school. This guy makes you miss. He will be a star someday for this USL offense. He's got all the things it takes, speed, size, determination. He's got a chance to play on Sunday someday. Now they were expecting Darren Brister back to play. He injured his knee in the spring. He's out for the year, so Joseph has to make up some room as Sonier goes to the outside. Pass is complete, and at USL may have their first first down. Let's see where they mark it. It will be a first down. Franco Smith on the reception, his fourth of the year. That's not the kind of tackling I don't think R.C. Slocum had in mind this year when he went back to his old system of defensive play. What happens? It looks like they're trying to strip the ball instead of bringing the guy down. Hey, you got to tackle him first and then worry about stripping the ball because when you go to strip, that's when a good runner or a good receiver is going to break a tackle on you. A guy like Elvis Joseph will break it. First first down of the afternoon for USL with 6'10 remaining in quarter number one. You can see the total yards of the two teams. Stokely in motion. He has been extremely quiet. Penalty flag is thrown. Sonia is hit, lets it go. And the pass, is it complete? Yes. Stokely on the reception. The junior from Lafayette, Louisiana, the coach's son. Sean Corietto really put the pressure on Sonia, and they're going to bring it back. They're, they're going to call a hold on this against USL. And one of the blockers, I believe it was the fullback, grabbed a blitzing outside linebacker, brought him to the ground, and he knocked over three A&M guys. But other than that, it would have been a very positive play for USL. Spot foul. Feet down. Even though that didn't count, Nelson Stokely's son did a whale of a job positioning his body to make that catch. He only needs two more catches to become the all-time leading receiver for USL. Great concentration. And you're going to see right... Well, I don't know about that oh, now. I don't, know. I don't know about that. That looked like a clean block to me. But it's a good job by the quarterback at getting on the corner, Sonia, and keeping his presence and poise and throwing the football. Now that pushes it way back, and now USL facing first and 29 on their own 12. A&M showing blitz. Here they come, and Sonia is going to be done. Right at the 10-yard line, Warwick Holdman coming in from that linebacker spot. That was a quarterback draw that time, Ron. He was not going to throw the football down the field, but the A&M defense did a wonderful job of seeing it and reacting to it. Holdman saw it. He wasn't fooled at all. He's starting to come up. He's going to blitz. He gets off the block, and Sonia runs right into him. Quarterback really had no chance on that because defensively, it was the perfect call. Second and 31. Boy, that linebacking tandem of Wynn and Holdman are good for A&M. Linebacker tradition here at A&M. Sonia flushed out of the pocket, throws it across the middle, and the pass will be incomplete. Intended for Marcus Woolridge, the freshman out of Crowley, Louisiana. But once again, Sonia now is limping. That is something that Nelson Stokely can ill afford to happen. He has a redshirt freshman, Lance Domek, sitting in the wings, but they don't want to have to play him. Yeah, who only threw two passes last week and completed one. AM on that last play, Ron, was in their nickel defense. Something they haven't used a lot this year, but they want to get some work on it today against USL. Stokely, Gassaway, and Franco Smith, wide receivers for USL on third and 31. Stokely moving around a lot. Sonia is hit as he releases the pass, and it is incomplete. Chris Theory coming in from that linebacker spot, the sophomore from Baytown, Texas, and that was an impressive defensive performance by AM. Well, it was third and forever on that, number one. Number two, it was a screen pass that takes a long time to develop. And Thurry came right over the top of the offensive tackle, Chad Hackamack, and almost just leveled the quarterback before he could throw the screen. You got to get rid of the ball a little bit faster, and I'm not sure screen in that situation is the right call, Ron. Well, they wanted to get back to the wrecking crew defense. They're on their way to doing just that. 
The putt by Shaw. They're going to let it roll down to about the 47-yard line, make it a 43-yard putt. No return. 4.56 left in the first quarter. A&M leads it 14-0. Let's take a look at our Dr. Pepper conference leaders, and we'll have our individual scoring leaders, and it's Sir Parker leading the way. And that's only after one game. <laughs> I know. How about three of the top four with Hall and Bryant throwing in there? Again, only after one game. After they one got a lot game. of points last week. And they may get a lot of points this week. Well, the A&M offense will take over on their own 47-yard line. They have been successful thus far this afternoon. Stewart remains in the lineup. They keep it on the ground. Parker still on his feet, still moving the legs, still not up down, finally thrown to the ground. Garrett Johnson has to come up from that quarterback spot to finally bring down Sir Parker. You know, he's got also vision like Dante Hall. He can see the field. And one of the things you can't coach is vision in a running back. He's looking over here. The defense over pursues. He cuts back against the grain and then gets up the field. Something you cannot coach is vision in a running back. I think he can help him a little bit with it. But, Ron, he's either got it or he That's doesn't. Right. And one thing the coaches wanted him to do is try to be a better runner inside the tackles. They said, this guy's got the speed to break it on the outside. They want to work him more on the inside. First and 10 for AM after a pickup of 12. Stewart going top side. He has a man. The pass is there. Touchdown, AM. Stewart put it right on the money to sophomore Chris Cole out of Orange, Texas, only his second reception of the year. That's got to help Brandon Stewart's confidence. And Steve Marshall, the offensive coordinator, said yesterday, we want to run, 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 play action, and throw deep. And that's exactly what they did on first down. They threw deep. That was the Brandon Stewart that everybody had hoped they would see last year. Bryant for the extra point. Three for three this afternoon. We're not even out of the first quarter yet. A&M leads it 21-0. One thing they wanted Brandon Stewart to do is play within the system, Artie. They, they thought he was trying to be Superman a lot of times last year. He was 56% first six games throwing, really went down last half of the season. That's exactly right, and he does a wonderful job here of ball handling by throwing the fake, but then putting the ball up so Cole could run underneath it. And I'll tell you, you know when a quarterback is happy when he runs off the field and he's jumping up and down because what he's trying to do, he's just trying to inspire everybody else. And he is making a statement to be the number one quarterback here. And I'm not trying to start a controversy here. <laughs> but, you know, so far, he's playing pretty good. He's playing very well. But Brandon Stewart is very real realistic about the two-quarterback system and what he has to do to improve. If you just make good decisions, get us in the right play, have good ball security. You don't have to make big plays. You can win football games doing that. You know, you have great players around you. Get them the football and, uh, you know, just make good decisions. And, and you can win football games like that. Well, one thing that has helped Brandon Stewart this year, they have brought in Ray Doerr as a quarterback coach. He has coached a number of great quarterbacks who have played in the NFL. Yeah, he's a quarterback guru, so to speak, around the country. He's coached Warren Moon. He's coached Chris Chandler. He's coached Rodney Pete at USC. He has really helped the, both of these quarterbacks understand the system but be more confident in what they're doing. Kyle Bryant's probably going to be the most tired man on this football field later. His kickoff again into the end zone. USL will take over again, first and 10 from their 20. Is that really true that they named him after the stadium? Yes. It is. I didn't huh? believe it. I thought it was this legend, but well, I think it is. It's a good thing my parents and your parents did not follow <laughs> suit because you'd be Three Rivers Thulin <laughs> and I'd be Yankee. Tino for Yankee <laughs> Stadium. I don't think that would go over very good on the air. I was afraid you were going to call me Forbes Field or Pitt <laughs> You know, I was a little worried there. USL takes over on offense. They need something in a hurry. Sonia, they want to get him out on the perimeter. They do this time, and they pick up their second first down of the afternoon. The pass is complete. Brandon Stokely on the reception. That's good play selection that time by USL because they're getting him on the corner away from the rush of Texas A&M. He's throwing a high percentage passer. He's got one guy in mind to throw to, and that's Stokely. 
but at least they have a chance, the undermanned USL team, to execute the passing game. Well, Stokely has just tied Wade Butler as far as the all-time leading receiver in USL history. One more, and the record will be his. Here is a guy that never started a game as a freshman, but still had 75 receptions to set an NCAA freshman record. Pressure is on. Sonia has dropped. There'll be a loss of about three on the play. Quinton Brown coming in from that linebacker spot. He's playing with a stinger in his neck. They think he's okay, but they really wanted to see him have some action today. And that's that wrecking crew attitude that R.C. Slocum's been talking about. He felt last year they lost that a little bit. Playing a 4-3 defensive scheme, he went back to his old 34, started calling his defense the wrecking crew again. And the difference is, though, linebackers can blitz from anywhere in a 34 scheme. Now Mike Hankwitz, the new defensive coordinator, was a finalist for the job at Kansas. A couple of years ago, he was finalist for the head coaching job at Colorado. Sonier on the swing pass. AM with only one player there, but he's got it. Anthony Dozier from that tight end spot. But Jason Webster coming up from cornerback to make the stop. That was a tight end screen. What he did, he started to sprint to his left, stopped turned around and threw a tight end screen to Anthony Dozier. Dozier's a big basketball player out of high school that was a defensive lineman a year ago, but he's got pretty good hands. If you saw on the left of your screen there, he threw a block, then came out, and he's got those big guys in front of him, but they got to make a couple blocks. That, that was a good play, but the linemen in the screen have got to make a couple blocks for him. Webster, a true sophomore, third and 12, three wide receivers for USL. AM's coming with a bunch of people. Sonier goes down, loses the handle. Let's see if they give it to AM or they'll call it down. It is AM's football. And it is number nine, Dat Win, right in the middle of things. Chris Theory is the one who really put the pressure on Sonier, but it is Dat Win who made things happen. That win, Mr. Productivity, another blitz, though, by Texas A&M. They are really trying to put pressure on this young USL team. Now, you're going to see Wynn come all the way around the top, but the ball gets knocked loose, and that's what happens when quarterbacks scramble sometimes. They carry the ball out in front of them. Well, we have a new quarterback. Randy McCowan is in the lineup. We have a penalty flag thrown. The pass is complete, or Dante Hall. No penalty. Dante Hall out of reception. And so Randy McCowan coming in for Brandon Stewart. Stewart was very successful, but they're going to stick with their two quarterback system and the numbers on McCowan for his career. And you know, it's amazing to me, Ron, the coaching staff at Texas A&M does this by feel. RC never wants to put Head a ball. young man. Unsportsmanlike conduct, celebration on the offense, 15-yard penalty, still first down. Never wants to put a young man in, take him out of a game in a negative situation or put him in the game in a negative situation. So I think it really calls for some psychology and some consistency from the coaching staff to do this. Even though with a 21 nothing lead, let me tell you something, folks. R.C. Slocum is not pleased with that. We were at practice the last couple of days. He has really put the thumb down on some of these guys because he wants to get Texas A&M back to where they were. And he will not stand for any of those little mistakes like that right there. That cost him a bunch of yards. Second and 16, ball on the 37-yard line for AM. McCowan keeps it on the ground to Parker. Dancing his way. Maybe gets two on the play. Now, I think that's one of those rules, though, Ron, that has to be looked at at the end of the year. Excess celebration. A week ago, a couple weeks oh, ago, yeah. we there was one before the opening kickoff when a <laughs> Colorado State player came out, and he was so excited, they flagged him. So I, I think, you know, football should be fun, but let's not make this a no-fun league here either. No. Most officials have been very lenient on that at times. There are some that kind of don't like it. McCowan rolls out. Pass is going to be complete up to the 25-yard line. Leroy Hodge on the reception out of Rosenberg, Texas. The coaching staff from A&M will execute the game plan with both quarterbacks, but they think McCown can run a little bit better on the corner. So when he's in there, you might see more of the sprint out, roll out type passes. Just short of the first down, so Kyle Bryant's going to attempt the field goal. They're putting it down at the 32, so it'll be a 42-yard attempt for Bryant. 
one for one this year. Snap is good. The hold is good. The kick is good. Kyle Bryan, who is the roommate of Brandon Stewart and punter Shane Luckler. What a threesome they've got. They got punt, pass, and kick all squared away. At AM, four for four as far as possessions. 24 0, we are still in the first quarter, believe it or not. Now, the upcoming schedule for Texas AM, as we look at the score, you can see they take on North Texas State up in Dallas next week, then the game on October 4th, Artie. And that's the game that's going to determine where this Texas AM team is at when they go play at the University of Colorado. These first three games have been, quote, preseason games to R.C. Slocum. And by that, he meant he wanted to see what kind of football team he had where they're at, Ron, but also what they do well and what they don't do very well. So the first three games, preseason, but this one right here is a barometer for where this football team is at. Forty-one seconds, Kyle Brown will kick it away yet again. Uh, USL had 13 kickoff returns coming into this game in just four games. That tells you how much their defense has been on the field. And that's what they don't want to have oh, happen today, goodness. Ron, because the heat, the physicalness of Texas A&M will start to really wear them down. Well, they said last year was their toughest schedule in their team's history. This year, though, with Pitt, Texas Tech, Oklahoma State, and A&M, I'd have to say that's pretty doggone tough, too. Well, Kyle Bryant's kick was not a pretty one. A penalty flag will be thrown as it ventures out of bounds. You know, Ron, looking at him kick, it looks like he's trying to place the ball too much, which is why it's going right or left, a little bit like some of your golf shots. Oh, oh, boy. It. Smack it. First down, 35-yard line. Well, USL is going to take it because they'll have pretty decent field position up to the 35-yard line, and R.C. Slocum is going to talk to Mr. Bryant about just that. Jim Knox is standing close to something that he really shouldn't be, Jim. <laughs> I think you're right. We're with the busiest guys perhaps on the field today, the Parsons Mounted Calvary. Their job is to shoot the cannon off every time the Aggies score. Now, a true story this week, someone from USL called down to A&M. They asked how much ammunition the Parsons Mounted Calvary bring. They say 20 rounds. They said, well, you may want to bring a little bit more because they think it's going to be a high-scoring game. So far, that's holding up. Well, there is the man responsible for the first three scores, Brandon Stewart. Thanks, guys. Penalty is going to be against USL, who has been penalty plagued here in the first quarter. Now, if you're Nelson Stokely, obviously this the score is 24 nothing. You don't want it to get out of hand because you still have football games to play. What is he going to try to accomplish? Because you know. He is not going to quit coaching. I think he should try to start running the ball a little bit more because what's happened, he has thrown the ball so much here in the first quarter that no, no ticks have gone off the clock. So that's why we're still in the first quarter and it's 24 nothing. He's got to make the clock run a little bit more. Well, he said he wanted to disperse and dispense, meaning they wanted to spread people out. Well, they're doing that by their formations, Ron, but you still have got to pound it in there a little bit. Now, once again, USL is going to be a victim of a flag. Ball. ball start offense. Five yard penalty. Repeat first down. And they push him back five more. Chad pa Peterson, the right guard, looked a little over anxious on that. And you know, again, if you're a guard, you can see the football being snapped too out of the corner of your eye. Oh, yeah. Guys, got to use some common sense in these things. Ten yards and penalty backs him up. It's now first and 20 from the 25 yard line. Final 35 seconds here in quarter number one in College Station. Sonier's pass is complete up to the 30. Franco Smith on the reception, the senior out of Shreveport, Louisiana. That was a three-step drop that time, which means the quarterback will come back, take three steps only, and then throw a quick hitch. Now, they have changed quarterbacks in that series. Lance Domek is the quarterback. He threw two passes only last week and completed one. Playing about 100 miles from his hometown of Houston, Texas, as R.C. Slocum would say, as the crow flies. Lance Domac, just a freshman, six foot, 192 pounds, a redshirt freshman, and that is going to be the end of the first quarter. Jim Knox, what do you have for us? 
USL's quarterback Ryan Sonia has just entered the USL locker room. They're checking out his knee. Nothing appears to be serious. They say that he could be returning, but right now they are checking out the knee. Quarter number one is in the books, and A&M has been successful every time they've touched the ball. They lead 24-0. Football is brought to you by Dr. Pepper and your local Dr. Pepper bottler. Dr. Pepper, this is the taste. By Gatorade Thirst Quencher, you don't have to live life thirsty. Life is a sport. Drink it up. And by Southwest Airlines, with fares so low, you have the freedom to go places. Beautiful day for football in College Station, and if you're an A&M fan, you are enjoying this one. 15 minutes in the book, A&M leads at 24-0, along with Jim Knox and Artie Gigantino. I'm Ron hey, Bullen. USL on second and 14. Pass is incomplete by Lance Domek. Now, Sonier went out last week with a knee problem and replaced by Domek. Domek had a pretty good high school career, however, over 2,300 yards passing the football. But he's really being thrown to the wolves this afternoon. Yeah, it's a tough situation to come into. And, you know, out of high school, he was ranked the 13th best drop back quarterback in the United States. I didn't know they did that in high school. What do you have? Scramblers, sprint out guys, option guys, and drop yep. back guys? That's amazing the way they do those recruiting services now. I hope they break it down. Yeah. These, these well, guys. If he's the 13th best drop back passer, yeah. in the what right is he a runner? Right handed <laughs> drop back passer. When he wears a white jersey. <laughs> well, Brandon Stokely, the wide receiver, is going to call the timeout as Domek got over the ball and with 14.57 left in quarter number two, 24 0. Aggies have the lead. Mike flies over here on the USL sideline. Charles Woods, the starting defensive cornerback, has his foot up and in ice. They're going to x-ray it at halftime. They think it possibly could be sprained. Well, Charles Woods from Conroe, Texas. That's where USL spent the night last night, just outside of Houston. One of the keys for USL, that big offensive line that we've talked so much about, has to block well. And the coaches were concerned because USL has given up 12 sacks coming into this game. And big is not the word. They're the second biggest offensive line next to Wisconsin in the United States. Last week, they played Texas Tech, and Texas Tech had the third biggest offensive line in the country. Watch out McDonald's and Burger King when those, <laughs> when those two groups get together. But they outweigh the A&M defensive line, Ron, by almost 50 pounds. But the key is using that way. Third down and 14. USL has not been successful here on third down this afternoon. Franco Smith in motion. Chased out of the pocket. Penalty flag is thrown. The pass is complete to Brandon Stokely. What a catch. And if it doesn't hold up, that will be disappointing. This is a young man. If that catch counts, we've got two flags down. He will become the all-time reception leader in USL history. What concentration and hands for a young man who came to USL. They said he was scrawny. He was little. Hit the weight room, and now he's could be, quite possibly, Division I A's all-time leading receiver in two years. I love those coaches' sons because they know how to play the game, but they also know what it takes to be a good player. He is not very big at six foot, 193 pounds. Pass was completed. Also, personal foul roughing the passer on the defensive team. Also, defensive pass interference, which will be declined. 15 yard penalty from the point of where the reception was made. First down. Stokely has great concentration. He has great hands. But watch here when he goes up to get the ball. He moves the defender out of the way and then out rebounds him for the ball. He reminds me of Michael Irvin sometimes from the Dallas Cowboys going up for the football. But when he's running routes, he reminds a lot of people of a guy by the name of Steve Larkin. Oh, boy. A real possession receiver. But he didn't look like a possession receiver on that. He looked like a forward going up for a rebound. Now 33 yards on the reception, tack on the penalty, and that will move the ball all the way down to the A&M 21-yard line. Stokely had 15 of the team's 32 receptions coming into today. Domek out in the flat. Pass is complete to Smith, and he is chased out of bounds at about the 15-yard line. 
They're keeping it simple on that. Just a quick down and out, just trying to get some yardage. Well, and they're also keeping it quick so he can get rid of the ball very, very fast. And that time, Phil Myers, the outside linebacker, just leveled Dominique again. What they're trying to do is rattle the young guy. Second and four, ball on the 15-yard line. Two wide receivers left, one to the right, lone setback. AM showing blitz. USL keeps it on the ground. Joseph pops it up, and AM got the football. Trent Driver on the recovery, and that snuffs out the first real threat by USL. It's the opposite of last year already. Exactly. You know, that's two turnovers for the USL offense. Last year, as we talked about, AM committed eight turnovers. Good job that time by the linebacker getting up there and putting his hat right on the ball. When you put your helmet on the football, the football usually pops loose. And M takes over on the 18, first and 10. Driver out of Cleveland, Texas. We have penalty flags down. It'll be against a &M. Trend Driver not only recovered the fumble, I think he also caused it. He did cause it. Five yards, push it back. One thing AM wanted to do today that they had problems all last year, and this is something R.C. Slocum really wants to work on. In their six losses last year, R.C. Slocum's come, uh, team committed 22 turnovers, and if you look at some of the numbers, they were in just about every game. Yeah, and they only had 28 the entire year. So 22 out of 28 came their six losses. First and 15, 14 and a half left here in the first half. McGowan's still the quarterback, Dante Hall. Bouncing off tackles, holding on to the football and just keeps the legs moving. Hall not very big at 5'8", 190, but he showed a little power there, aren't he? That's why he's the leading rusher in the Big 12. That's why he's going to be one of the leading rushers in the United States at the end of the year. He can just move it and he makes people miss, but he also makes people bounce off of him. The thing that he does a great job of there, he keeps his leg moving, moving up the field. Big 12 freshman of the year last year. On second and three. A&M's got the first down, and once again, it is Mr. Hall. This is like the old A&M teams. Run, 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 fake, throw the bomb, score. That's what it reminds me of. Well, again, R.C. Slocum at the end of last year said we're going to get back offensively and defensively to Texas A&M football. And running the football is Texas A&M football. At least it has been. And he wants to lead this conference in rushing because he knows if he does that, he'll probably be playing in the championship oh, yeah. game. Said he got that philosophy of running the football from Emory Ballard, his first boss here at AM. USL showing blitz. McCowan, quick look in pattern. It is complete and another first down. Derek Spiller, the tight end out of Lamarck, Texas. R.C. Slocum made one of the all time great statements yesterday. He said, I wouldn't trade Spiller and Campbell, my two tight ends, for anybody in college football. Hey, I'm not sure I would either. Spiller's the third strongest guy on the team. You know, he's 6'3, about 240, and Campbell, the backup, is like the fifth strongest guy in the team, and he's 255 pounds. I'm not sure you can go anywhere, even on Sundays, right. to find two guys like that. So I kind of agree with that statement. Uh, I tell you, Spiller is an outstanding athlete. Another first down for the Aggies. On the reverse. Spiller making his way up to the 50-yard line. Going to be knocked out of bounds maybe just inside the 50. Mark Silvis having to come up from that quarterback spot. Well, this just goes you the flex, show you the flexibility of Spiller. He's right here. Watch what happens now. It's going to be a fake into the line, and the tight end is going to come all the way around and catch it on the reverse. But look what happens to all these defensive guys. They get fooled because you don't see a tight end reverse very often. How about a tight end with 4-6 speed, too? Well, that's why you run a reverse with them. That's right. <laughs> Second and one. And a and is not going to get it. Going to be a little bit short. You know, they worked on that reverse yesterday, and all the coaches and players were kind of getting after Spiller. Hey, I'll bet you can't go all the way. And, you know, he did a good job of running there, but they were really on him not to drop the ball. They were having a good time doing it. But that's a dangerous play for a defense because you usually see reverses, Ron, from the wide receivers. 
Third down at two with 12 and a half left to play in the first half. Only the third time that AM has faced a third down situation. McCowan wants to put it up. Got the first down and about 10 to spare. Pass is complete. Again, the spiller. He drops the ball, but they're going to say he was down. Spiller had one reception in the first game. He is getting some work this afternoon, and this is the kind of game that R.C. Slocum really wanted to have. He said, my receivers need to catch passes. My quarterbacks need to throw passes. And, you know, they did a good job of protection that time. That was a play-action face. But watch Hackrat here at the center, number 69. He hits him high, but then he throws his hip into him and knocks him down with his legs. Good job for the center on that one, Ron. Kobe Hackrat out of Conroe, Texas. First and 10, ball on the 43 for A&M. And that big offensive line moving the defensive line out of the way so Sir Parker can pick up a couple. I like this offensive line, but my favorite player, 62, Samisi Haimuli. Here is a guy that when he was recruited by Bill Johnson, Johnson walks in and says, I want to wrestle you. Yeah, and if, and if I win, he said, you come to Texas A&M. So the kid didn't want to wrestle him. <laughs> so I said to Johnson yesterday, what would you have done if the kid wanted to wrestle you? He said, I would have ran out the door. <laughs> <laughs> and he's got a cousin here who's also Tongan named Moses, who is bigger than him. On second and six. McCowan's going to keep it on the ground. Tiki Hardiman barreling his way upwards of the 32-yard line, and that should be good for yet another first down. Charles Johnson coming up from that free safety spot, probably the best athlete on this USL defense. Hayamuli weighed in yesterday at 300 pounds. They've got him listed at 295. But watch him right here. Get off the ball, drive. He gets his hand in there, a little bit of a hold job, but he keeps his feet moving. He's just got to keep it moving up the field a little bit harder. I think the coaches will get on him for that one, but they think he is the best, quote, potential offensive lineman of this group, and he's really a nice young man. Said he wants to start a Tongan tradition in Texas. Not bad. He is from Eulis, Texas, which is just outside of Dallas. Well, it was not a first down. They have just about a couple of inches, so it'll be third and one with 11-15. Jim Knox, Hardy Gigantino, and Ron Thulin coming your way from Kyle Field in College Station. AM had a big week last week against San Houston on third down. They were six out of ten for 60%, which is just fabulous. As the core of the 50,000 plus sing, AM third and about one. McCowan back to Parker. Really was hit way short of the first down, just bounced outside. We have a penalty flag as Charles Johnson made the stop. Maybe a face mask call. Good job, though, by Parker because it looked like he might have a chance of not getting to the first down. You know, you look at Parker and you look at Hall, they are distinctly different runners. Parker's the kind of guy that would like to go outside all the time and be more of a slasher type runner. Where Hall obviously wants to run inside. We've talked about his balance and his vision. John Laurie getting Ball, a workout. Personal foul, face mask, end of the run, 15 yards, automatic first down. Parker's gets the ball, he knows exactly where he wants to go, and then at the end, you're gonna see the face mask. Now, that to me is not a 15-yarder. That was a five-yard penalty, not a 15-yarder. Sir Parker was AM's leading rusher heading into the final two games last year. Didn't play very much. In fact, the only time he really played was against Texas, and he had a 103-yard kickoff return. He's not supposed to return it when it goes in the end zone, but he said, I had to touch the ball one more time. And as we mentioned, he questioned whether or not he would be in an Aggie uniform this year. USL showing a blitz. McCowan's going upstairs, intended for Parker, and it will be incomplete. You know, one thing about Parker, too, and I think it affects some of his running inside, he's had a shoulder problem, problem, Ron, you know, a bruise on his left shoulder. So sometimes when a tailback has that, he doesn't want to dip it up inside quite as much. First incompletion of the afternoon for AM QBs. You know, I throw the ball to Parker, too, though. He is the fastest guy oh. on this AM team. He runs a 4 4 40, which is fast. Second and 10, ball on the 15. 
right up the middle. Tiki Hardeman finding a couple of yards. Closing in on the 10-yard line. They're going to mark it at about the 11. Watch Haimuli here. He does a great job of pulling and trapping, which just opens up the hole for Hardeman inside. Give that one to our big Tongan right guard on that. He threw the key block on a trap. Third and six. Just about five minutes gone by here in the second. Parker in the backfield by himself. Parker in motion. The ball is fumbled. USL says they have it, and so do the officials. It looked like McGowan started to come out of there too soon without the football. Sometimes when you overcoach reading down the field on passing plays, quarterbacks get out of there too soon, and they don't have the football. And you're Dwayne Viator recovered it. You're going to see him here. He starts to look down the field before he has control of the football. Quarterback's first job, Ron, is to get the football and then execute the play. But secure the football first. First turnover of the afternoon for Texas A&M. They lead it 24-0. USL had a nice drive going the last time they had the football, only to cough it up themselves. On first and 10, ball on the 13. Dolbeck is going to be dropped. Rollins comes in to make the hit. That win was there. That was another blitz by the Texas A&M defense, and what they're trying to do is scrape the linebackers around on these sprint-type passes. And we have another penalty flag thrown, and it's going to be against A&M. Well, he lost six on the sack, but it's going to be negated by the penalty. Let's listen in to John Lurie. Another unsportsmanlike conduct call against the Aggies. Maybe a little celebration again, Artie? That's what it looked like. They've got to settle down here because it looks like USL is starting to get their second win and get a little confidence that they can move the football. Now the ball's moved up to the 22, first and 10 for USL. Gomez to Stokely. Up to the 20-yard line, or back to the 20-yard line, I should say. Lost the three, Cedric Curry from that quarterback spot. Move from the safety spot to the corner. That was a big time tackle that time by Curry. He just does a wonderful job of coming up when he sees Stokely with the football, getting his balance, wrapping him up, and bringing him to the ground. That is mm. clinic tackle right there, Ron. Every coach will want to cut that one out and show it to their defensive backs how to tackle in the open field. And I think Coach Stokely's going to look at that film and tell his son Brandon, don't carry the football like that. Yeah, because he could have lost that football. You're absolutely right. Second and 12, loss of two on the play. A&M quick off the ball, no penalty flag. Gomez pass is complete to Stokely. It is complete, maybe picked up three on the play. Jason Webster on the coverage. I think one of the adjustments you're going to see in the second half by the A&M defensive coaches is to get somebody rolled up either in zone or man on Stokely because it's obvious USL is throwing the ball to him on almost every down no matter where he is. He is the number one guy in this offense and to the credit of the coaching staff at USL they are trying to use him. USL one for five on third downs and that is what they face right now. Nelson Stokely saying earlier this week that he is concerned with his third down plays because they haven't been successful this year. Dolman out in the flat, passes complete to Stokely. Nice looking move, and he's able to get up to the 39 yard line. Penalty, Bob. Penalty, Bob. Pickup of 13 on the play. We have a penalty flag thrown, and it's in the backfield, and it's going to be holding against USL. We are seeing Brandon Stokely at his best. Here is a guy that obviously he's a marked man. They don't have a lot of other receivers that they can throw the ball to. But yet this mount, young man still is able to get open. Oh, it's throw and catch. But, you know, guys like him, he reminds me of Fred Bolitnikoff and, as I said before, Steve Largy. They just somehow get open. And he's not fast. He probably runs a 4.7, not a 4.6, but he gets positive yardage all the time. He is what you call a football player. You know what he is? He's the offense of that win. That's right. To USL, as you know, that win is to the, Colorado, excuse me, to the uh, A&M defense. 
And the numbers on him in 1995, his freshman year, he set the record. Never started a football game. Looks like a choir boy. Third down and 20 as USL backed up because of the penalty. 7.40 to play in the first half. Domic has to step up in the pocket. Scrambling, dumps it off, pass is complete. A vicious hit at the 28-yard line on Baron Rogers, the 5'9 junior out of Abbeville, Louisiana. He used to be a safety. The hit was put on by Cedric Curry, I think. Well, Curry's got great speed, and when that great speed starts coming up the field, you can really deliver a blow. But Domek's got outstanding poise right now. He's getting some pressure, but he's hanging in there. He's got complete control of what he's trying to do. you got to give him a lot of credit right now. Chris Shaw set to kick it away. The sophomore out of Lafayette, Louisiana. Not good for the first down. Fourth and eight. The spiral, but it's a line drive. Picked up at the 30. Up to the 50. It is Dante Hall. He has running room. Goodbye. In 1996, Dante Hall, who seems to be cramping up right now, was number 11 in the NCAA in return average, number one in the Big 12. He had over 570 yards in return yardage last year. That was good for 70 and a touchdown. And now you know why, because he can make it happen with blocking and without blocking. Bryant on the extra point, right down the gut. 7.15 left in the first half. 31 nothing is our score. We'll return to Kyle Field after this word from Dr. Pepper and your local Dr. Pepper bottler. Come back. A&M with over 235 yards. USL yet to break 80. It's going to be Terrell from the three. Runs into a pack of people still on his feet, and he is going to be buried at about the 14-yard line. Toya Jones on the tackle. What a play by Dante Hall. You know what I liked about it? He was just running by everybody. But you know what? You never have a great punt return without good blocks. There's one by Jeff Wilson. There's two by Cody, and he makes somebody miss, and then he finds the end zone. Good shifty running, but Ronnie had two excellent blocks along the way. Good runners, good scheme, good blocking, usually equal positive results in a punt return. And the camera a little shaky there when the cannon went off. I think we may have had a heart attack up I'm there. glad we're up here. I'll guarantee you that. Well, USL has got some work to do. Trailing at 31 nothing. Eight minutes gone by in the second. Domic's pass is going to be incomplete. The big hit put on Richard Sandusky. He had it in his hands. Boy, he took a lick. Rich Cody. You know, Cody's an interesting guy. He's a former walk-on, and this is his second year of starting. He's a big hitter on this football team. And for a guy that's not really overly athletic, he's the fastest 20-yard shuttle guy on this football team. Yeah, he's got a little pedigree. His dad played for the Chicago Bears. 1967-75, I think it was. There it was. Domic and company now at second and ten. Seven minutes to play in the first half. Forced to put it up in the air. Stokely again, and he reaches for the first down. Going to be a little bit short. Not to run the story into the ground, but I'll tell you, Brandon Stokely, you know, you're not sure exactly how good he is. Stats sometimes lie, but I think he's shown us here in the first half that he is the real thing, and he may be the NCAA leader in a couple of years. Oh, he probably will, as long as they have a quarterback in this program and the system to get him the football. Because eventually, people say on defense, all we got to do is double-team that guy to take him out of the game, a la what used to happen to a Blitnikoff, a Largent, or some of the great present-day receivers like a Jerry Rice. Third and two. Football! Adams got the football. Jason Glenn, the freshman out of Houston, Texas. They said he has great anticipation, and he did there.
Well, the handoff didn't look too clean, did it, Artie? No, it looks like he bobbled it on the handoff, and they have just got to settle down. Watch, you're going to see him. He doesn't get the ball, and then he puts it on the hip of the back. You can't do that as a quarterback. Lindsey had his hands open, but he put the ball, Domic put the ball on his hip. You got to get the ball in the breadbasket, so to speak, especially in short yardage situations. Uh, Glenn's brother Aaron, former Aggie. Three turnovers now for USL. Well, the pass was intended for Spiller, just a little bit too high. He just rushed it. You got to take your time on that and just throw the football nice and easy because, as you said, Spiller was wide open. Just loft it up in there. And Brandon Stewart is back into the lineup. You know, that's the problem sometimes with two quarterbacks. Guy comes in off the bench a little bit cold. He gets some pressure, but he overthrows it. Ray Dorr is not going to be happy about that pass. Second and 10, ball on the 22, closing in on six minutes left in the first half. Stewart straight, drop back into the flat. Pass is complete up to the 15-yard line goes Leroy Hodge. Pass is complete to number 88, Leroy Hodge. One thing Hodge has learned how to do, and they really sort of stressed it on him, is learn how to run patterns. You know, a lot of receivers already, you know, got great hands, great speed, but they can't run a pattern. Well, especially in this new offense, there's a lot of precision in this offense. In fact, the quarterbacks are taught to throw not to receivers, but to landmarks like cones and parts of the goalposts. And the receivers run the patterns according to the landmarks. Hodge goes in motion. Third and one. Stan Stewart's going to keep it out of the ground to Sir Parker. Gets the first down, he's inside the 10-yard line. You know, there's a new freshness, a freshness about this A&M team uh -huh. this year, and a lot of it's on offense. He brought in, R.C. Slocum brought in three new coaches, uh, David Craigthorpe, the wide receiver coach, Ray Doerr, the quarterback coach, and Steve Marshall, the offensive coordinator and offensive line coach. And they are just doing things a little bit different. But what it's done, it's given these kids on offense here, Ron, a fresh start. First and goal now, ball on the eight-yard line. AM already leading 31 to nothing. Taylor in motion. Stewart's going to put it up top. Pass is complete in the flat. Touchdown, Tiki Hardeman. And Stewart is down. May have gotten the air knocked out of him. The multiple formations that AM is now throwing at their opponents and will continue to do this year. Very impressive. When you can put a guy like Hardeman on the outside like that, who's got a great pair of hands, and you get him the football, that is potent. Yeah, it's very potent, and especially when a USL team is a little undermatched here and they're trying to compensate by blitzing. And when you do those things, sometimes you leave a guy completely free, which is what happened on that one. Now well, Stewart is still down. The Trainer has a smile on his face. Brandon is up, walking up off the field. Appears to be okay. Let's look at it again. Good job of dropping back. But you see Hardeman sneak out of the backfield, and he's wide open. There was absolutely no one there to cover him. It was an assignment error by the USL defense that time. But that's what happens when you try to blitz to compensate for an overall weakness in your defense. Bryant makes it 38-0. Hall, Parker, and Hardeman, that powerful backfield of AM, have each scored a touchdown. Brandon Stewart's led a couple of drives. 536 left in the half. AM by a bunch. Is this afternoon's 12th man, Chad Franson out of Diana, Texas, just a sophomore. You know, this is one great traditions in all of college football and I think it's exciting and it makes college football what it really is. Well, Jackie Sherrill put all walk-ons and 12th men on the kickoff. RC doesn't like that. His troops this time are going to put USL in a hole yet again. So AM that's coming off their worst record since 83, 6-6 six and six handily today as they're looking for their second victory of the season. And you know the special teams coach here at Texas A&M is a guy by the name of Sean Slocum, son of R.C. Slocum. And the proud father of two beautiful little grandchildren, and R.C.'s a proud grandfather. Is this our third week we've had a coach's son? 
Now Terry Allen didn't have a coach at Kansas, but somebody we've had a, we've had a couple of coaches' sons. Yeah, we? absolutely. I mean, that's part of the business, you know. Why not take care of people in your own family, right? <laughs> yeah, but I don't want to argue with mom. <laughs> <laughs> Yell at son. First and ten, ball on the eleven. Clouds are beginning to roll in here at College Station. Domex pass. Oh my! It was golden goalpost time for Jason Webster. He had nothing but pay dirt in now, front of him. He did the right thing in knocking the ball down, but he's always going to think when he watches the videos on Monday, I could have caught that for six. He sees the ball. Nah, he couldn't have caught that, Ron. That was a nice play. That was a big-time defensive back play. Knock the ball away. That's exactly what you want to do. Second and ten. Ball is on the 11-yard line. Three wide receivers for Lance Domic. Brian Sonier is out of the ball game, the starting quarterback. Hope to have an update on him at halftime. They're going to keep it on the ground up to the 12-yard line. Baron Rodgers on the carry. A former pole vaulter. Warwick Holdman on the tackle. Holdman plays this Sam linebacker in this defensive scheme, which means that he lines up on the offensive tight end most of the time. He redshirted last year, but the coaches are expecting a big year out of him. And when AM blitzes, he is usually one of the defensive players, one of the linebackers that is involved in the blitz. He's a good, solid football player for the Zaggy defense. Well, they said the turning point for this young man's career really came in the spring. He injured his cartilage, and he said he wanted to play through it and wait for the operation after camp and he did on third and nine the big hit right at the 15 short of the first down for Rodgers Holdman on the tackle well that was a draw play a little bit of a misdirection play but Holdman was just sitting there waiting for it he's having a good afternoon again and if he continues to play at this level, he might end up being an all Big 12 defensive player. Once again, Hall is back. He's standing on his own 45-yard line. And he should get a chance to return it. Nope, calling fair catch. And AM will begin on their own 42 with 355 left in the first half, leading 38-0. Let's take a look at our Southwest Airlines game summary for this afternoon. Well, one thing USL wanted to do was stop the rush. They haven't been able to do that, Artie. And they haven't been able to rush the ball themselves. Minus 14 is obviously not very good. Only five first downs for the Ragin' Cajuns. 15 already for AM this afternoon, and we have yet to hit halftime. And Brandon Stewart's having a magnificent afternoon. Five out of seven for 100 yards and two touchdowns. That's big-time quarterback play. Once again, AM going with the two quarterback system. McGowan back in. He's going to go upstairs with it. Now he's going to bring it down, keep it. Takes a big hit as he nears the 50 yard line. He's going to be marked out at the 47 yard line. Daryl Albert coming up from that Mike linebacker spot. You know, you can see the positive decision making by the quarterbacks already this afternoon are making good, solid decisions, not giving up the big play, not throwing the ball away, gaining positive yardage. That's coaching from Ray Dorr and the offensive coaching staff. They've really created a nice atmosphere and environment for these quarterbacks, I think. On second and five, USL shows the blitz. They keep it on the ground to Burtis Rhodes, and he's able to get the first down up to the 40-yard line. And we've got two USL players down on that play. Rhodes, a freshman out of Terrell, Texas, number 32, had seven carries for 35 yards and a touchdown in the opener against Sam Houston. Boy, they need a couple more trainers for this. And you know, usually when two guys are laying next, door, next to each other on the ground, they banged into each other, missing a tackle. And you're going to see Rhodes here get the ball on a counter play and get up inside. Now, the injuries were back down inside, but he does a nice job of getting up the field. And he might be the next great running back Boy. here at Texas A&M. They're just reloading, aren't they? Well, they get them. People like the running backs like to come to Texas A&M. It's a good environment for running backs. Randy Young and Tyrone Abrams are the players that are hurt for USL. There is Abrams. He's sitting up. That's a good sign. You know, speaking of running backs here, the A&M offense have, have had 12 first-round draft choices in their history on offense. Nine of them, Ron, have been running backs. 
There have been a few the last couple of years. Yeah. <laughs> I can think of a few names. You know what's amazing, though? They've only had one Heisman Trophy winner here. That's right. That's John David Crow. Former athletic director. Yes. And a good friend of that man, R.C. Slocum. Jim Knox has an update on uh, the USL quarterback, Sonia. Jim? Ron, this team is beginning to look like a mash unit. Brian Sonia, he's back out of the locker room, but he's sitting on the bench with ice on his knee. They're going to recheck that knee again at halftime. They'll go back in the locker room, check that out, and see if he's able to come back out. So that's the latest on Brian Sonia, the USL quarterback. Well, they're not sure how bad it is, and a consideration is there's still a lot of football left in their season. McGowan, quick pass to the up to the 34 yard line complete to Aaron Oliver Willie Terrell on the coverage Oliver one of the most consistent receivers they had really came out in the spring yes he did and he I saw him yesterday out here on the track he was uh, in a kinesiology class believe it or not walking three miles on the track I said why are you doing that the day before the game he said because my teacher is making me come to class <laughs> and take this I said okay well, he's out of Arlington, Texas. Dad, of course, played for the Rangers and the Pirates. To name a few, Al Oliver. McCowan, the pass right across the middle. Good down to the 10-yard line to Leroy Hodge. Boy, McCowan had some mustard on that throw. You know, they think Hodge is going to be the big-time receiver here someday. He's a big guy. He's six foot two, 204. He's only a sophomore. He's a basketball player out of high school. They think he's going to be a big-time player. McCown does a nice job of looking all the way for Hodge, delivering the ball, throws the ball, rotates the elbow, completion. Pickup of 22 on the play. First and 10, ball on the 11. Closing in on three minutes. Oh, there's people jumping everywhere. Penalty flies the throw, and McCowan keeps it down to the three-yard line. Smart, heady play, because you don't know if that play is going to count or not. You don't hear a whistle. you got to go for it. That's exactly correct, and USL was blitzing that time. And sometimes when the offense is changing quarterbacks, they get used to the other quarterback's rhythm, and now another quarterback comes in, and it's a different voice, and it draws people off size, which is exactly what happens. Second down. And look it, they're putting the ball on the two-yard line, so McCowan with a heady play. You always tell defensive football players, like you just said, Ron, finish the play, because you never know. It is first and goal as we hit the three-minute mark, or second and goal for A&M. Up over the top. Not going to get in. The A&M players are signaling. Hardeman's going to be short. They did have the opportunity to get a first down there, believe it or not, and I think they at least got that, so it'll be first and goal now from about the one-foot line. Touchdown Tiki. He had 18 touchdowns in 1996. This guy has got a nose for the end zone. He already has a touchdown this afternoon. Two for the year. Hardeman right behind McCowan. On first and goal. Another six for Bernice Rhodes and AM. Rhodes' second touchdown of the year. Boy, he looks a lot bigger than 185 pounds, Artie. <laughs> he's a big guy. Hey, if he's 185, I'm about 160. Yeah. And we both know that's not true. <laughs> he's, a, he's a good 200 pounder, that guy. A&M 19-0 at R.C. Slocum's tenure as head coach against non-conference opponents here at Kyle Field. And Kyle Bryant's extra point is good, and they are on the verge of going 20-0. 235 left in the first half. And it's a 45 nothing football game. Let's take a look at the touchdown right from the goal line. You get a chance to see how it gets in. 
Rhodes is going to come across the grain. It's a little bit of a misdirection play. And the reason offenses like that kind of play, it gives their offensive line a little bit more time to surge up the field, number one, but it freezes the linebackers and they just can't run up the field to make the tackle. They've got to sit there and wait a little bit. And you see that's exactly what happens. But Rhodes does a nice job of putting his shoulder down and pulling himself into the end zone for the touchdown. You know, games like this, you want to tip your hat to some of the, the linemen never get enough publicity and every time we go to the practices they always say you got to talk about us so Cameron Spikes you had a nice block on that play Shea Holder you did likewise from that right side to open up that hole you cannot win in football today without a good offensive line and a good defensive line right. they don't have to be great but if they're poor you got no chance they have got to be good RC Slocum knows that he knows what it's take what it takes to put together a good football team offensively and defensively Jim Knox on the sidelines. What you have for us? Ron, Jason Bragg, the backup fullback for Texas A&M, went to the locker room, and apparently he sustained a knee injury, and they say he will not return for the rest of the day. All right. 2.35 left in the first half. Kyle Bryan again getting a workout. This is harder than a practice for him. Kicking more footballs. Marcus Woolridge is back for his first return, and Ellis. Brian kicking with the win, and it's going to be Woolridge. Crossing the 15, and that is where he is going to be stopped. Another Mazda scoring drive for Texas A&M. Let's take a look at the numbers. 58 yards, took him seven plays. McGowan, not bad. Two for two for 30 yards, only took him 80 seconds to do it. Well, you know, they did a nice job in that drive on of throwing the football. And a lot of completions, big completions. So they're trying to open it up or stay with their offense. I don't think you're going to see R.C. Slocum pulling the horn, so to speak, quite yet. Lance Domek still calling the signals for USL. Going to keep it on the ground to Baron Rodgers, who's getting a lot of play in time. Eric Lindsay is considered the backup tailback, but he is banged up, and they did not expect him to play. And we really haven't seen a whole lot lately of Elvis Joseph. Baron Rodgers has gotten a lot of playing time. And when you talk to the coaches of AM, they said the one guy that did concern him outside of Stokely was Joseph. But Joseph isn't in the football game. Well, he was only a freshman, and you never know, Ron, a heat. Maybe he got dinged up a little bit. You know, maybe he had an injury from last week. That's Mike Hankowitz, defensive coordinator for Texas A&M. Domic pressures on, dumps it off, passes complete. Good for a first down for USL. Anthony Dozier, the tight end from Klein, Texas, on the reception. He's a big one at 6'4", 245 pounds. You know, the interesting thing about him, he didn't play tight end in high school. He played tight end, I think, one game. He was a defensive end in high school, and they recruited him because they thought he was a great athlete who excelled on the basketball court also. But he was a defensive end that they have converted to tight end, and I think he's doing a nice job of that conversion. And the numbers this season on Dozier, USL only minus nine yards rushing the football. That's why they have to put it up in the air as we... Head to 120 left in the first half. Domic pump fake. A&M didn't bite. Could be picked off, and it won't be. Michael Jamison, the freshman out of Colleen, Texas, on the coverage, and another player is down, and it is Brandon Stokely. And it may be his knee. Well, it looks like his knee got or maybe, tang yeah. Excuse me, Ron. It looks like they got tangled up when they went up for the football. And let's hope it's not very serious. Now, Michael Jamison didn't bite on the pump fake by Domek. He was step for step and even really playing behind Stokely. Stokely couldn't get around him. And as you said, they may have had a little collision. This is probably the seventh or eighth time that the trainers have had to come out. And Nelson Stokely concerned about his son, obviously, not as a player so much as maybe his son. And it looks like, Ron, that he landed on his knee as opposed to twisted. He goes up for the football, and you're going to see here, it looks like he's coming down, and he lands on it and then twists it. Right there. You know, so let's hope that's not very serious, and it doesn't look like it will be. Maybe hyperextended? Could be. Could right be. there. Yeah. Right there. Pretty good coverage by the freshman, however. One thing about AM. 
they may not have the most talented defense, but they're, they seem to be stronger in number of players defensively this year. Yeah, they are. I think that this system suits the people that they have in this program more than the 4-3 did a year ago. They have an abundance of linebackers in this program. Second and 10 for USL with a minute and 15 left to play in the first half. AM bringing everybody. They're going to keep it on the ground. And not much for Baron Rogers. One, two, three, four, five. Jerseys of AM right around the football. That win right in the middle of it. Sean Coriette, number 44, also there. Coriette, smaller than his brother Quinton Coriette, one of the greats here. Well, that was good swarm that time by Mike Hankowitz's defensive group. And again, Hankowitz was a, was a longtime assistant at the University of Colorado, was at Kansas for the last two years. R.C. Slocum obviously liked what he did at Colorado and at Kansas and brought him here to run his Texas A&M defense. 30 seconds left to play here in the first half. 3rd and 13 for USL. 1 of 8 on 3rd down possibility. Domic's pass is complete. It is caught short of the 1st down. Brian Gassaway, the sophomore out of Sulphur, Louisiana. Warwick Holdman on the coverage and on the tackle. Now, every time you look up, Holdman's making a tackle. And again, I think he's one of the guys that you were talking about, Ron, that in this system, a young man like him can really prosper because he is a 3-4 outside linebacker. He is not a defensive end in a 4-3 or an inside linebacker in a 4-3. He is a true 3-4 outside linebacker. Now Chris Shaw is going to punt it away for the sixth time on fourth and one. Nice spiral. Taylor is going to take it at about the 10. Straight up the middle, up to the 25 to the 28 yard line before he's tripped up. Seven seconds remaining in the first half. And AM will take over. First and 10, 49 yard punt, 20 on the return. You know, an unusual thing, uh, Nelson Stokely coaches the special teams for USL. That's very unusual. You know, you find quarterback coaches, and you find, you know, sometimes a coach right. will help, like, uh, you know, Sonny Lubick does with the defensive backs. But this guy has decided this year he wants to coach the special teams. Should be the final play of the half, and it has been a very successful half for Texas A&M. Stewart's going to keep it on the ground, and that's going to do it. As the seconds tick off in Texas A&M, very successful in quarter number one. That man, Brandon Stewart, having a fine afternoon against an undermanned USL team. But this is the kind of game that R.C. Slocum really wanted to have, not necessarily score-wise, but just getting repetitions for both the quarterbacks, the receivers, and the backs. Yeah, he wants to worry, and he is worried about his football team to see where they are at at the end of this game. And even if they come out and score 45 points in the second half, which I don't think they will, Ron, he wants to see how his team improves. He's not worried about sportsmanship. He's worried about his football team improving. And he is with Jim Knox right now. All right, a very happy coach, R.C. Slocum. You guys did not do anything wrong this first half. 45 to nothing. You passed well. You ran the ball well. You pleased? I was really pleased. I, I thought our team would come out uh, with a lot of effort. You know, this was, uh, as I said uh, many times, this was a disappointing, embarrassing loss to us last year. And these kids were, were motivated to play this ball game. And I've, I've really been pleased with our execution on offense, and we're giving great effort on defense. Coach, what are you going to look to accomplish this second half up 45 to nothing? Well, this is a kind of an awkward situation for us, but uh, th this is a young football team. Uh, we've got young receivers. Our receivers need to catch balls and run routes. Our quarterbacks uh, need all the work they can get. And uh, we're very young on defense. We've got to work our defensive guys, and uh, we're just going to come out and play. And, uh, you know, we won't uh, uh, really try to take advantage of the situation, but we got to get ready for some big games down the road, and this football team needs all the work they can get. So we'll continue. We've rotated players in the first half. We'll continue to do the same thing. Thanks, Coach. We'll see you in the second half. Real quick, an injury update on Brandon Stokely, the wide receiver for USL. They're taking him into the locker room right now. Apparently, he sustained a knee injury. They're going to check him out. We'll see if he's ready to go in the second half. Ron? Very disappointing. He became USL's all-time leading receiver today. His status questionable. We'll return to Kyle Field after this word from Dr. Pepper and your local Dr. Pepper bottle. And it's going to sail out of bounds, and that'll be a penalty flag thrown on that play. 
And that's exactly how you did not want to start off the second half if you're USL. Brandon Stewart will get the call to begin the second half. Well, just a moment ago, Jim Knox had a chance to talk with USL coach Nelson Stokely. Hi, right, coach. Now 45 to nothing entering the second half. First off, how is son Brandon doing? Uh, he's probably uh, it's a hard, it's a tough injury. I think he's probably uh, we've lost him for the year. Probably oh, it looks boy. like an ACL. So we'll re-examine him when we get back and see how he is. But uh, it looks bad. How are you guys going to try to survive this second half? Well, I hope we got something to us. You know, we certainly didn't have anything to us the first half, and I think you have to question this football team. You know, after we've gone three, uh, three games and a half now, you know, we we we're not able to stop anybody, and we can't get anything going offensively. So, uh, you know, I think it's some some has certainly has something to do with the people we're playing. You know, they're good football teams, but you would think that we could come out here and have a little more to us than this. All right, thanks, Coach. Best of luck in the second half. Already, that's the kind of news, not only as a coach, I think more importantly as a father, you do not want to hear. No, and it didn't look that serious at the time, but that's just a shame because he's an outstanding young man. Mm. Well, we wish Brandon Stokely and Coach Nelson Stokely the best in this situation. Stewart is going to be dumped for a loss back to the 25. Let's take a look at our Sitco halftime statistics as Eugene Chambers came up with a pretty good tackle. You know, like we talked about, I think the biggest stat here is the balance of Texas A&M. You know, they cannot afford not to do that this year, and that's what R.C. Slocum has been preaching this entire preseason. But the negative stat here for USL is minus 12 yards rushing. They have to establish some kind of running game this afternoon. Third and second half. Oh, third and 20 for A&M. Their average start has been the 44-yard line. USL has been their own 18. That has been a difference. Straight back, looks over the middle. The pass is going to be picked off right at the 45. Mark Silvis. Silvis heads for the out of bounds, so USL not going to roll over and die, at least here early on. And reminiscent of a year ago, Stewart threw four interceptions a year ago, and again, that's not how Texas A&M wants to start off this second half. Stewart looks down the field, but he doesn't throw the ball well. He throws behind the receiver right in the Silva's hands. That was an easy interception and a poor throw. That Bumgarner, the intended receiver. Silva's his first interception of the year, so USL will take over on the AM 30-yard line. Now it's a matter of pride for the Raging Cajuns. They'll keep it on the ground of Baron Rogers. Oh! Is he hit hard by that win? That was vintage. That win. That win saw the counter the whole way. He shuffled down the line of scrimmage and made the play. That was an outstanding linebacker play by this little guy who plays real big with his pads. He's got a nose for the football. He comes up and he makes a short tackle. Gotta like him. Oh, I tell you what. I, I, I told you. I told you Thursday. I said you're gonna like this guy. He's all over the field. And I liked it because when I interviewed him, everything was yes, sir, and no, sir. Very impressive young man. Second and 11. Loss of one on the play. Domic's going to go upstairs. The pass over the middle is complete down to the 13-yard line. David Freeman, a freshman out of Rain, Louisiana. That win is a very intense player on the field. Off the field, he's not. So I asked him where his intensity comes from. You gotta be, you know, the dream has gotta be fun when you're enthusiastic. But in another case, you gotta be stay focused when you play this game. You know, it's so competitive. And it's just, I don't know where I get it from. I guess it's just something just I have in me. You know, it's always been with me, I guess. Moving on the USL line, that win. Here's a player that didn't even start playing football when he was in eighth grade. And he did it because he kept getting in trouble. His parents. Came over from Vietnam. They escaped right as the bombs were going off. Before Dat was born, they went to Thailand. Already, they didn't even didn't even know where the boat was going when they got out on it. They ended up now living in Rockport, Texas. Well, it's a great story. And his parents own Hootats, a seafood <laughs> restaurant down in um, Rockford, Rockport. Excuse me. And if he goes to the National Football League, he will be the second man of Vietnamese descent to play in the NFL. Eugene Chang from Virginia Tech a few years ago was the first. And I think he can play in the National Football League. Well, he loves being a role model to other Vietnamese kids. 
First and 15. Domic's pass is complete down to the five yard line. To the tight end, number 87, Anthony Dozier. That win was putting pressure on Domic on the play, but Domic did a nice job, and you mentioned in that second quarter, he does have a little bit of poise. He has poise, and what he's doing here, though, he's throwing the ball around to different receivers. So much of the first half was all the Stokely, 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 but here he's trying to get the ball to different receivers, and so far, so good. And maybe that interception was the life that this USL, USL team needed. 13 yards on the pickup, second and two. 11.23 left in the third. Domix got protection, throws it out of the flat, pass is incomplete, intended for Franco Smith. Jason Webster on the coverage. He is probably their best cover guy in that young AM secondary that's still untested. It's untested, but I think they're holding up to the test today, though, Ron. You know, Larry Slade, the defensive backfield coach, felt a year ago they probably played too much man-to-man -man coverage with a bunch of young defensive backs. This year, Mike Hankowitz comes in. They're playing a lot more zone, and they're taking advantage of the skills of the defensive backs. For Coach Hankowitz, his team faces USL with a third and two. Ball is on the five-yard line. They're going to try to run it up there, and the swarming AM defense doesn't give Baron Rodgers a whole lot of running room. He may have gotten down to the three and a half, which would be short of the first down. Let's see where the officials place it. Holdman and Cody in on the tackle. These are two pretty good hitters coming up, making the tackle between Cody and Holdman. And it'll be fourth down. And if, you, if you're USL, you got to go for it here and run the ball again behind that big offensive line and try to get a yard because obviously a field goal is going to do nothing for you here. Now, the question I have for you, would you throw it? I may, I tell you what, I may try to play action. That's what I'm talking about. And I always have said you'd be an outstanding quarterback coach because of that insight of the pass game. But first, I'd have my quarterback call a timeout. Well, Lance Domic doesn't like what he sees, so we'll step aside. 10:26 left in the third. Can USL get on the board? We'll have the answer. Cajun Cajuns. Rogers. He's gonna be dropped. Rogers, no match for number nine. That win again, and that was a good tackle. That was a good tackle, and that was an outstanding read by him. He diagnosed that play the whole way. You know, everybody talks about him reminding them of Simonini, who used to play here a long time ago, but he reminds me of Mike Singletary. He has a nose for the ball. He comes underneath the blockers and makes the play in the backfield. That is outstanding linebacker play, Ron. Four tackles for a loss this afternoon for the young linebacker. And AM will take over as they snuff a threat by USL, at least for the time being. Penalty flag thrown. AM keeps it on the ground. You know, by going back to Dat Wynn, here is a young man that found out there was a young Vietnamese boy here in College Station that had just come over to this country at an elementary school. And the teacher said, Listen, come on over, would you talk to him? He not only went over, he spent time with this young man, and the teachers felt okay, he did his job. He's kept in contact. In fact, the young man now cuts his hair like Dat Wynn. Exceptional young man. And he knows that he could be a role model for these youngsters here in the College Station area. I don't, I don't know it's a responsibility. It's just something I would love to do. You know, if I grew up and I had people, you know, I look up at, you know, that's role models that come and help me out, who, you know, make my day or even make, you know, the whole year, you know, going. And you feel more, a lot comfortable if somebody, you know, comes and shows support or even just, you know, in a way where they just, some people are watching you or even, you know, trying to lead you to, you know, the path where, you know, will be successful, even be happiness. Well, they're successful this afternoon. The fake by Stewart. He's going deep. The pass is going to be almost picked off. Intended for Chris Taylor, the freshman out of Madisonville, Texas. Former high school quarterback, and the coaches are high on this young man. Garrett Johnson, part of the Johnson & Johnson secondary for a USL on the coverage. And that was an example of what the coaches were talking to us about yesterday. Run, 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 play fake, and throw deep. They kept 
nine blockers in that time and sent Taylor on a one-man pattern because they wanted to try to hit the home run to him. Second and ten, ball at about the 23-yard line for AM. Stewart will try it again. Off the fingertips of Sir Parker. Willie Terrell was coming up from that strong safety spot, the junior out of Tampa, Florida. And you know what it looks like from here? A&M is not playing fast so far here in the second half. It looks like the Raging Cajuns got a nice talking to at halftime because they're playing a lot faster exactly. and less intimidated than they did in the first half. Well, one thing that A&M wants to do this year is intimidate and attack. But right now, at least for the second half, USL may have gotten a talking to, and they're the ones showing a little effort. That may be a fumble. It was. That was a lateral, and Dante Hall is going to be dropped for a loss. Daryl Albert, number 48, the Mike linebacker, Chucky Woodall, everybody was there to surround Hall to make sure very dangerous play for the Aggies. You're seeing two things. I think you're seeing USL really run around, but you're also seeing Texas A&M not execute. This should be a completed pass. He's got to catch that with two hands. He can't go up and one hand that because, as you said, Ron, that is a fumble in the backfield because the ball was thrown behind the receiver. First punt for Shane Leckler. The spiral. Taken at the 40. It is Schumach. He is still on his feet. Cuts. He's got some room. Tries to split the defense up to the 45-yard line of Texas A&M. Cornell Schumach on the return. Hey, they will begin play right there. And we'll return to Kyle Field after this word from Dr. Pepper and your local Dr. Pepper bottle. And he's in Notre Dame and Ohio State trying to get back to the winning tradition that they've had. They had nine wins or more each year in the 90s up until last season. Domek forced out of the pocket, throws across the middle, dangerous pass. It's going to be knocked down, intended for Jeremy or for David Freeman. Texas A&M has not let up. They blitzed again, expecting pass on first down. Mike Hankowitz wants to play a lot of zone today, but he also wants to practice, so to speak, some blitzing. So later on in the year, when he has to blitz, he's already done it in game situations. Well, last year at times, it seemed like they got away from the blitz and away from what R.C. Slocum really had as his philosophy for defense. When R.C. Slocum was the defensive coordinator here, they ran a 3-4. They changed it a couple of years ago, and it was very frustrating for him, for them to be running a defense that he didn't really believe in. Domek on second and ten. He's going to be dropped. Chris Theory from Baytown, Texas, the 6'2", 226-pound sophomore. His second sack of the year. You know, Theory's a guy that wasn't even supposed to play. The great linebacker, Roland Bradley, was injured, and Theory now has taken his place as a backup to Phil Myers. But there, he comes off that corner extremely fast, and he's a difficult guy to block, especially for those big old tackles from USL, who weigh over 330 pounds each. It's hard for them to get out there and block a quick guy like Theory. Nelson Stokely was concerned about his offensive line, even though they are big, they've had some problems this year. Domek's going to hand it off on third down. Elvis Joseph, we haven't called his name since early on in the first quarter. That win there to make the stop. Jim Knox is on the sideline with our favorite defensive players family, Jim. <laughs> I tell you what, yeah, Dad Wynn's mother and sister are here. We're going to talk to Sister Kareem. She actually is from California. She's in the computer business. You don't get to see Dad play too often, but you got to be enjoying what he's doing today on the field. Absolutely. He's doing great. How many games have you attended to watch Dad play? Uh, unfortunately, this is my second game. <laughs> and your thoughts? I think he's a wonderful player. I think this is great. And your mother, you did a terrific job raising dad. He's not only a great football player, he's a great individual off the field, correct? I just... Your mother's a little camera shy, but what an outstanding human being off the field, right? Yes, he is. A happy Dat Win family in the stands, and they're enjoying a big Aggie lead, 45 to nothing. Ron? On fourth down, the ball is turned over, and it'll go to Texas A&M. You know, his mother, Datwin's mother, didn't want him to play football after he broke his arm in the eighth grade. And to this day, I remember him telling us last year, she still doesn't want him to play football. Yeah, but, but his jersey <laughs> hangs in that restaurant, and they are proud parents. 
Not bad. Johnny Holland, a pretty good player. AM takes over on offense. And they're going to keep it on the ground, and you can hear the pads popping all the way up here. That was a pretty good defensive effort by USO. McCowan back in, Sir Parker on the carry. You know, as, as the offense now from Texas A&M, Ron, you've got to just continue to execute your game plan. Don't try to pull in the horns too much. You know, don't get out of character here. Don't look at the scoreboard. Just execute the game plan. The number's on McCowan so far this afternoon. Second and 10 from the I formation. McCowan to Parker. Parker tries to split the defense, but he is going to be corralled at about the 43-yard line. Daryl Albert, a junior college transfer, he is really listed as the third-team linebacker, but he has been in an awful lot of tackles this afternoon. And that was a good tackle on, a, on an elusive runner like uh, Sir Parker. He did a good job of bringing him down to the ground, and if the USL defense can make a play here and force a and to punt, you're going to see a little bit more competitive third quarter than we did the first half. Third and six, six minutes left in quarter number three. USL showing blitz, and here they come. And they're going to stack up the run. Tiki Hardeman, no place to go. You know, that's what I was talking about at the beginning of the game, Ron. you got to take chances if you're USL. And they are starting to finally take some chances here in the second half. Make some big plays. Try to cause a fumble or two. You can't sit in a base defense and try to stop people like Texas A&M. That's called taking a chance when you have a safety in the backfield a second after he hands the ball, quarterback hands the ball off to him. Luckler with his second punt of the afternoon and second of the second half, and it is going to be Colonel Schumann. No place to go, caught and dropped at the 10. 48-yard punt, nothing on the return. We'll be back to Kyle Field with AM still on top. Able to have it ready for this season. Still be at the lovely G. Raleigh White Coliseum, <laughs> which is one of the loudest arenas you will ever do a basketball game in. 45 0 our score. Jim Knox, Artie Jigantino, and Ron Thulin on a beautiful Saturday afternoon in College Station, Texas. Five and a half left to play in the third quarter. Elvis Joseph dropped behind the line of scrimmage. That win again on the tackle, his fifth tackle for a loss this afternoon. You know, what's happening? No one is accounting for that win. He is shuffling down the line of scrimmage like a good linebacker should. He's diagnosing the play, and he's coming up the field and taking chances, which is okay as long as you make the tackle. But for a linebacker to make that many tackles for losses today means that they are not accounting for him in the offensive scheme. Five tackles for a loss, minus 20 yards for that win. In case you just joined us, Brian Sonier, the quarterback, USL, out with an injury. Their leading receiver, an all-time leading receiver. Brandon Stokely injured just before the end of the first half. He is out, quite possibly for the year. USL very undermanned today. We have a penalty flag down. May have used up too much time. That's what it looks like. And, you know, when a quarterback is not used to working... Not used to working with the first team like Dominic isn't, you know, sometimes he takes a little bit too much time. And the other thing is he's not used to getting the signals from the right. sideline. So, you know, the coaching staff has got to quicken the pace in terms of getting the plays into him because that's going to happen. Well, hats off to that man right there, Nelson Stokely, in his 12th year. He could become the all-time winningest coach in his school's history like R.C. Slocum could here at Texas A&M. But they haven't rolled over here in the third quarter. They have come out with much more intensity than we have seen the entire afternoon. Joseph and Clement in the backfield. The Raging Cajun back up. Dolan's going to go upstairs. Picked off. Intercepted. He will be dropped at about the eight-yard line. Cedric Curry on the interception. out of Houston, Texas with the pick. And that's his second of the year. He had one last week against Sam Houston, and that was an ill-advised throw. There were too many maroon shirts there to throw the ball. If I were Dominic, I would have run that thing, Ron, I mean, or throw it away. You don't want to throw it into a crowd of maroon shirts. Well, a m has had, I think, one turnover this afternoon. Much more for USL. And AM is going to be knocking on the door again. McCowan, or Stewart back in the quarterback. Pass is complete down to about the one foot line. 
Dan Campbell, the other tight end on the reception. Here you look at the interception. He throws it right into his zone, but there's too many guys there. Don't throw it. You got to throw it away. There's no way that that ball is going to get in there. Again, quarterback decision making, Ron, is so important. You got to know when to throw it and when to throw it away. And that is something number seven of AM had learned rather hard last year. Brandon Stewart, our quarterback decision maker, is going to keep it, looking for his second TD. Now they're stacked up. The officials have not made a signal yet. No, I don't think they're going to give it to him. Now they do. Dolmick throws the interception. Stewart gets his second touchdown of the afternoon, and for the second time, it's on a sneak from a yard out. Smart play down there. You don't want to take a chance by throwing an interception, number one. But number two, you don't want to take a chance of fumbling the football. Credit those guys up front of moving the defensive front of USL out of the way. Kyle Bryant remains perfect on the afternoon, right up through the uprights. He only missed three extra points all of last year. Let's take a look at that touchdown again and watch that offensive line of Texas A&M. Big surge up front. Give these guys right up in there the credit. They relocate the line of scrimmage of USL defenders into the end zone. And that's what you want. And that's what Coach Steve Marshall, the offensive line coach, wants out of those guys up front. Move the defensive line into the end zone. Let the quarterback fall into the end zone. And that's exactly what happened that time. Well, for the most part, the first team offensive line, with the exception of Hamuli, is, uh, Hamuli is still in. Shea Holder's in for him, but they're getting the work that they need. And here's a guy right here, Ray Dorr, talking to Brandon Stewart that deserves a lot of the credit for the way these quarterbacks are playing. As we said, Ray Dorr is a little bit of a quarterback guru, having coach Warren Moon and Rodney Pete. He is an outstanding quarterback coach that has really brought a new attitude to this position here. He really has. I'll tell you, yesterday and, and Thursday during practice, he was doing drills that, I'll be honest with you, I haven't seen a lot of guys do in probably four or five years, wet football drills, because they thought it may rain today. Well, you know, you can't expect a quarterback on Saturday to be able to deal with a wet ball unless you practice with a wet ball once in a while. So that's one thing he's done. The other thing that he's done, he's simplified the passing game, and he's established what we call landmarks. In other words, targets on the field for the quarterback and the receiver to throw to and to run to as opposed to just throwing to the man all the time and it's really really working so far in these first two games with this two quarterback system Mike Ellis from about the five straight up the middle has a little bit of running room up to the 25 and the maroon stop sign comes up well, one thing R.C. Slocum has done is provide a lot of other teams with some head coaches and other people. Yeah, and Bob Davey obviously is the head coach at Notre Dame, but Bob Davey and Tommy Tuberville were the defensive coordinators here at Texas A&M A under R.C. Slocum. So he's had four men leave this program and become head coaches, and he's put 12 others in Division I-A programs and the NFL as assistants. And it's a credit to that man right there and his leadership and the way he delegates authority in this program. He's very proud of the fact that other guys are coaching in other places. He encourages it. Well, you know what? He should be because I think it's the responsibility of a head football coach if an assistant does a good job for you to go out and promote him and allow that man to get on with his career. And most assistant coaches want to be head football coaches. R.C. Slocum, when he was the defensive coordinator, wanted to be a head football coach, and he understands that as a head coach with his assistants. He is the best unknown head coach in the United States in my view. How about his winning percentage behind Phil Fulmer, Tom Osborne, and Joe Paterno among active coaches? Not bad. Only Barry Switzer at Oklahoma won more games during his first seven years. Dumek on the carry and he's going to pay for it. A couple of big time hits. Well, that's what I was talking about, though. Most people in the country, Ron, don't know that. That R.C. Slocum at Texas A&M is the fourth winningest active coach. Most people don't know that. Well, Domek's doing everything he possibly can. He was limping at one point early in the first half, and you can see the winningest active Division 1A coaches, and there is R.C. Slocum ahead of Steve Spurrier, and I think that would surprise a lot of people. And that's pretty good company to be in, needless to say. Third down and 
two inside of two minutes here in the third. Gomick's going to keep it on the ground. They will be close to the first down, and I think they may have gotten it. Elvis Joseph. Not much explosion from that young man this afternoon, but you have to give a lot of credit to the AM defense for that. Well, I think those guys have got something to do oh, with I it. I think they do. Big time. Big time. Right Mike Hankowitz, right defensive coordinator on the far side. Steve Marshall brought in as the offensive coordinator for AM. And one thing I like Steve Marshall saying, I like just working with the offensive line. I don't, I don't want to have to worry about the quarterback. With Ray Dore there, I can just do my job. And they, the coaches seem to really get along with him. 30 to play on first down USL from their own 37 yard line maybe get two on the play if a frustration last year for the AM defense they came in fourth in the Big 12 in total and fifth in scoring which is unacceptable by Texas A&M defensive standards so RC Slocum wanted to make some changes he did make some changes and he went back as we talked about their new old look it's new for this year, but it's their old look of a 3-4 defense, and he brought in that man, Mike Hankowitz, to do it. One thing they want to avoid this year is the blow-ups. Last year, they said they had blow-up games. They would hold these people, then they'd have a game like BYU or K-State, and that really skewed the statistics a lot of the time. Domek is going to be pulled down by a face mask. That flag is going to be called Ron Edwards, the freshman out of Houston, Texas. Ron had the right idea, but unfortunately, the wrong effort. You know, I was standing next to R.C. Slocum yesterday on the practice field. From the previous spot. Still second down. We were looking at all of his young freshman defensive linemen. He brought in seven last year. But that guy, number 96, Ron Edwards, was the most impressive-looking guy physically to me. I said to R.C., who is that guy? And he said, it's Ron Edwards, one of our freshman defensive linemen. And Bill Johnson, who does a wonderful job of coaching the down guys here at A&M, will do a fine job with this young man. And this guy is going to play on Sundays four years from now. Second and four, final 30 seconds of quarter number three. Domic has the pressure on, lofts it up above the defense, pass is complete, good for a first down to Richard Sandusky, the redshirt freshman. Domic showing a lot of poise again. Rocky Bernard out of Baytown, Texas, number 95, the one putting the pressure on Domic on that play. You know, Sandusky just sneaks out on this and is wide open, but it looks like Coriate was supposed to get a little bit deeper. He was coming up too much on the sprint out pass to contain the quarterback. And I know Mike Hankowitz and R.C. Slocum are not going to like that. You've got to stay back until the quarterback, Ron, crosses the line of scrimmage. Well, USL is going to have to call a timeout as they trail in this ball game, 52 to nothing. One thing everybody says when a game gets like this is that the coaches are trying to run up the score. R.C. Slocum said that is not going to be the case today, but he still wants his team to get in the much-needed work. My history uh, is, is really pretty clear. Well, I, I've tried to teach sportsmanship with our players. I, I've always thought that, uh, that a coach has an obligation to not try to just rub it in on someone else, and I've never done that. Uh, I think the record stands for itself. This team is such that we have a lot. Brandon Stewart needs to complete all the passes that he can. Right now. And Randy McGowan's the same way. We've got young receivers that need to run routes and catch all the balls they can. Well, this was Coach Stokely during his press conference this week. He said last week Spike Dyke was, was nice to us. This week I don't think R.C. Slocum will be. <laughs> but I, but like R.C. Slocum and both Nelson Stokely said these two guys have known each other probably since college days. So, I, you know, there, there's a lot of respect. I believe R.C. He's a sportsmanship guy. He needs to work. This is only his second game, and he had a bye last week. He's got to get this football team ready to go play North Texas, Texas next week, Ron, and then go up and play Colorado. So this man will not run up the score. In fact, last year he was upset at his own team. It wasn't an upset by USL. It was, he was upset at the performance of his own football team only Homer Norton has won more games in A&M history R.C. Slocum passing DX Bible one of the great coaches in the history of A&M Domek the pump fake lets it fly pass right looking up into the sun it's going to be incomplete intended for David Freeman the freshman 
Michael Jamison, another freshman out of Colleen, Texas, on the coverage. And I've been kind of impressed with Jamison today. He hasn't bit any of those pump fakes. No, he's done a nice job for a young guy. He's a small guy. You know, he's only like 5'10, 175 pounds. A play, a lot of football here at Texas AM. You know, we've seen a very strong AM team. Obviously, this is not in the caliber, nothing against USL of Colorado, but. It all really amused me that so many people wrote off AM this year, but I think they have showed so far. Granted, maybe not the Colorado, they may be a team that will challenge for the South this year. Joseph on the carry bumps to the outside, and that's the first sign of any moves that we've seen from the young freshman, Jason Glenn, on the stop. Well, he got a little bit of running room outside, and he's not the kind of guy that wants to pound it up inside, Ron. He's more of a wide runner where he can use that good 4-5 speed that he has. Now, as you mentioned, he was brought down by Jason Glenn. Pretty good shoes to fill. How about his brother Aaron, two-year starter at quarterback for the Yankees, led the nation in punt He's a Thorpe Award finalist, first-round draft choice. By the Jets. Starts now for Bill Parcells. See if little brother can do likewise. A lot of brothers here. Corey Glenn. Third and one. Eight seconds left in the third. Domek's going to get the first down as the clock ticks. Now, speaking of brothers, um, Sean Corey Quinton, his older brother, didn't want him to come to Texas A&M because he felt the pressure would be too great <laughs> for him to follow in his brother's footsteps. So Sean came to A&M anyway, and he said, hey, I want my brother's number, number 44. I'm going to make my own name. So sometimes that's an advantage, and sometimes it's a disadvantage. Then you have a brother like Steve McKinney, number 72, an offensive lineman for A&M, who he says his little brother who's here now is going to be better than him. We have a timeout. That's the end of the third quarter, and it's all A&M. They lead it 52 to nothing. We'll be back. Quite a sight. First and 10 for USL as we begin the fourth quarter. Another pass is almost picked off. Anthony on the coverage. Cornelius Anthony, the redshirt freshman out of Missouri City, Texas, but we have a penalty flag thrown on the play. Well, just when USL seems to be driving, they've done it a couple of times today. They come up either with a turnover or a penalty that pushes them back. Well, what happens, Ron, is the fact that there's a lot of new players playing. They're not used to playing uh -huh. with each other. They've had some injuries. you got another quarterback in there. The cadence is different. The game plan is probably a little limited. So those things, plus just being on edge of playing a good team like, like Texas A&M, sometimes causes those, type, those types of infractions. One thing Nelson Stokely of USL can do, and that is coach offense. He was the offensive coordinator for Clemson. He was on that Clemson staff six years where he had three ACC titles, a national championship. He was a quarterback himself at LSU. And he's the perfect fit for this program. He's from there. He loves Louisiana. He's the perfect fit. Domic rolling out left, throws right, passes tip. It's going to be picked off by Texas A&M. Shud Horn on the interception. Still on his feet as he makes his way up to about the 28-yard line. He had an interception last year. This is his first this year. Sean Horn, who is a starter in 96, now backing up Cedric Curry. And last week he was slowed down or two weeks ago by an ankle problem. But what happens when the ball gets tipped up in the air? It usually ends up in a defender's hands. And that's exactly what happened on this play. You see the rollout pass, the ball gets tipped, and it falls right into Horn's hands. That's one of the easiest interceptions he'll ever have. So hard to roll left and throw right if you're right-handed. Parker on the carry, up over the 30. Dwayne Viator out of Youngsville, Louisiana, on the stop there, Sean Horn. You know, he had a knee problem that went completely undetected, and that's something that sort of concerned the coaches there. Well, you know, modern medicine doesn't catch everything all the time, unfortunately, but back, and he's ready, and I know Larry Slade, the defensive backfield coach, has got high hopes for this guy. Randy McCowan in a quarterback for Texas A&M, leading 52-0. 50 seconds gone by here in the fourth quarter. We're glad you're staying with us on this one. McCowan out in the flat, complete to Aaron Oliver. 
There is no truth to the rumor that Jim Knox has been seen with a lot of dogs, but he is with one right now, Jim. That's pretty good, Ron. We are with <laughs> Reveille Six. She is the first lady of Texas A&M, also the Texas A&M mascot. And she just turned four years old. Now, a little A&M mascot history for you. Reveille Five was retired last year, but Reveille One, Two, and Three, Four have been laid to rest right outside of the stadium. Now, the reason why One, Two, have been laid to rest right outside of the stadium. They said they just wanted to give her a good look at the stadium scoreboard. <laughs> hey, hey, on the ground with Sir Parker. You know, that's 28 years in human years there, Jim, so uh, I think she's probably available. Alan Cannon, the sports information director, who's done a wonderful job helping us out, said there was a about where they're going to bury the former Revelies but he kept telling us about a hundred times. I promise she can see the scoreboard. A lot of tradition at this place, a lot of little things, kissing your date, 12th man, Reveille, you gotta love it because it's college football at its best. <laughs> at least I don't have kissing Reveille as a tradition. That would be kind of bad. 13 and a half to play in the ball game. Pass is gonna be complete out in the flat. At the 41-yard line, Matt, Bumgar Matt Bumgarner out of Luling, Texas. Mark Silvis on the coverage. Well, the story goes how Reveille became Reveille is that a couple of cadets ran over her, I guess, with a car or something in 1930, and they brought her back to the dormitory. And then she started barking the next morning when they were playing Reveille. And from that day on, Reveille became part of this Texas A&M tradition. You like that story, don't you? You've been waiting to use that. I couldn't wait. I think that's great <laughs> stuff. Uh, Sir Parker on the carry. <laughs> Paid on the stop. Sir Parker has had quite an afternoon. All the running backs have. Parker, 71 yards. He's carried it 11 times. Fastest of the back. Played with a nick shoulder against Sam Houston problems this afternoon. A&M third down and three. Ball on the USL 39 yard line. USL bounces some people around. McGowan gives it to Parker. Bounces off one tackle but he is going to be swarmed on under. Dwayne Viator leading the charge along with Willie Terrell who made the first hit. Terrell a junior out of Tampa Florida. You know that was a counter play that time and you cannot get a counter going if defenders are in the backfield. That's the way to stop a counter to get the defenders into the backfield to get into their feet. Watch number 13 come up the field and make the play right there. That's a nice job by him. But Parker had no chance because the USL defenders had crossed the line of scrimmage and gotten into the backfield. Shane Luckler is going to call a timeout. Just about to attempt his third punt. 40 and 48 yards on the previous two. And as the teams take a timeout, so will we. AM leads it 52 0. USL. Luckler, a high wobbly kick. Catch, drops it. He's able to regain it at the 12 yard line. You know what I think is one of the great stats of Texas AM? R.C. Slope, who's been the head coach here for nine years, going on nine, he's never had a punt block. That's amazing. All the times that you've during the year, you average about 75 a year. Not to have a punt block is just great coaching in that punt team. I think he realizes as a defensive coach himself that how important that is, and that can turn a game around when you're playing the Nebraskas, the Texases, the Oklahomans. Well, most defensive coaches stress special teams, running the football, and obviously playing great defense. And, you know, you throw the ball because you have to in the game. Now, you need it for balance, but the components to win games are solid special teams and running the football. Joseph on the carry, and he is going to be swarmed under by a bunch of maroon jerseys. Trent Driver on the tackle, along with Rocky Bernard. Well, AM's getting a workout today, and as, as Coach Slocum talked about, he wants his team to play today. Because sometimes in these blowouts, if you take your guys out too soon, they don't get used to game conditions, and then later on down the road when they have to play a full game, they're not ready to do it. Right. And this is the what he called execution time for his players in the fourth quarter. To the left side of James Clement, Trent Driver is right there to meet him. Let's check in with Jim Knox again, Jim. Okay, Ron, 
back in the 1900s, the original colors of Texas A&M were red and white, but in the late 1920s, that changed due to a shipping era. What happened was they sent off for New Jerseys. They got the New Jerseys back, but the color was maroon instead of red. A member of the athletic department said, hey, I kind of like this maroon stuff because there's too many other schools with red colors. So that's why they're now the maroon and white Aggies. Very interesting. I like that. Joseph, sur surrounded by the moon and white Aggies. Trent Driver again on the tackle out of Cleveland, Texas. A senior gives that linebacking core a little bit of experience. Good thing they weren't pink jerseys. <laughs> <laughs> this would not be a good no. looking football team. No, it would. <laughs> pink jerseys. How can you intimidate wearing pink? Right? Well, you can't. <laughs> no, no. How Richard Simmons does. Fourth and one, 9.50 to go in the fourth quarter. Chris Shaw's had a workout today. I thought he's done well. He is somebody that Nelson Stokely's had questions about. He's going to have to run it. Has a chance to get the first down and still on his feet. That was not by design. Shaw made lemonade out of lemons. Well, the guy that goes over and pats him on the head is the snapper, Math Matthew Zeldin. Zeldin is a biochemistry major, and that was a bad snap that time. Watch, the ball comes floating back. It's too low. He does a good job of fielding it, and he makes a wise decision not to punt it because it probably would have been blocked, and he has presence of mind to tuck it underneath and go get the first down. But it was a bad snap. I think Toya Jones, number five for AM, had visions of goalposts in his head as he came running in. He thought he may have a block. Good job by Shaw. USL stays alive. Fumble, and it's on the ground, and I think AM's got it. And they do. You know, Ron, you talk about being your own worst enemy. USL is as bad an enemy today to themselves as Texas A&M is. Cornelius Anthony on the recovery, and A&M will take over with 9.25 left to play in the ball game. Well, the ball just gets jarred loose again by Rocky Ben comes in and he knocks the ball out. Some of these have been missed handoffs, but a couple of these fumbles today, Ron, have been balls jarred loose by the Aggie defenders. Fifth fumble for USL. How about Stewart? Last year, four interceptions. This year, four touchdowns. Two rushing the football, two throwing the football. A little bit different. Stewart is going to be sacked. He loses the ball, and USL gets it back. Willie Terrell on the sack. Stewart just lost the handle, and just as we're talking about how he's turned it around, he coughs it up. You're going to see the fake into the line of scrimmage, but Terrell comes and does not bite on the fake. He did a good job of seeing the football and staying as deep as the deepest shoulder of the quarterback. Nice job by Terrell of not biting on the fake. Charles Brown, don't call me Charlie on the recovery. 19, first and 10 for USL on the 45. Domit swings it out in the flat. Pass is complete. Out of the Aggie 48 yard line. Franco Smith on the reception. And Domic still trying to stretch out the leg at times. Knowing R.C. Slocum very well, I think this is good for his team. Not to play as well in the second half because now he's got something to coach next week and getting ready for North Texas State. Hey, we didn't play a complete game. We came out and played real good in the first half, but we kind of squandered around here, Ron, in the second half. So the coaches deep down inside are probably smiling a little oh, bit because yeah. they have something to coach now. On second and two for USL. Trying to get the goose egg off the scoreboard. They're not going to get the first. It'll be close. But you and I were talking yesterday how coaches sometimes, when things are going well, they look for some type of rallying point, something that they can get on their players about. Well, no football player has ever played the perfect game. You always have a coach, you know, like we get coached sometimes. You know, we think we have a great <laughs> broadcast, and we get a list of things that we didn't do very well. Right. But no one has done or played the perfect game, and coaches always want to find something to help a player get better. Third and two, eight minutes left to play. Lance Gomek in for Brian Sodius and early out of this football game. Joseph tripped up. Chris Theory 
got the hand on him. Maybe a fumble. a and saying they got the football. Let's see. They're going to give it to a and Yes, they do. Fury got a hand on Joseph. And I wasn't sure if the ground caused the fumble or he coughed it up before then. Quentin Brown comes up with the, with the big skin. Well, he's going to see it now. Quentin Brown's in there also. Him and Fury lay the wood, so to speak, on Joseph. But the ground looks like it caused the fumble. Yeah. That was a close call by the official. Can't really tell on the replay. Cannot tell. But the ball's, well, the ball's down there. Ball's down and the ball's out. Those are hard on officials, all those bodies around. And m goes back on offense. <laughs> Ernest Rose has done a nice job in a reserve role today. Picks up 12 on that run. AM's got a great stable of packs. Oh you know, boy. This guy Rhodes, he, he could start at a lot of teams for a lot of teams right now. They have got backs on top of backs, and maybe the best one is on the bench with a knee injury. First and ten on the 41, clock ticking down. Nearing seven minutes to play in the ball game. AM led 45 0 at halftime. It's 52 0. Okay, Penalty flag is thrown right in the pile. Burnest Rhodes on the carry. Well, let's grade AM's paper right now. The three things they wanted to do offensively was establish the run, protect the quarterback, and the quarterback decision making. Well, I think you've got to give them an A in everything. They've done that and more today. But the biggest thing to, to, to Ray Dorr was the quarterback decision making ability because that's what gets tested in games. You can, you can work on it in practice, you can work on the running game in practice, but you never get under the fire in practice like a quarterback does in a game. Well, the block was below the leg, so they're going to push AM back a little bit. Uh, de a defense for a &M. They wanted to uh, stop the run, be tough on it. Don't give up anything cheap, and I think that's A-plus on both of those counts, too. First and 21. First man through, big hole right up the middle, and it's T.P. Hardiman. He's got some daylight. Crosses the 20. What a move by Hardiman. Down to the four-yard line. was going to have a gain of about 15. He turned it into a lot more than that, Artie. Well, it was a trap play again. They're running that one back trap and the left guard, Chris Valletta, comes across and does a great job of blocking on the trap. Outstanding blocking up front and Hardman just pops in the hole and he's got clear sailing almost all the way to the end zone. Good job by his teammates and downfield blocking. First and goal ball on the five. Chris Taylor had a nice block on that play. McGowan keeps it in the end zone. Wide open touchdown. Dan Campbell, the tight end, was wide open. McGowan faked out everybody. Just absolutely beautiful ball handling by McGowan that time. He had everybody in the ballpark fooled. Watch the ball handling here. He does a great job of faking it inside, turns his head and looks, and obviously he's wide open in the end zone, but he's wide open on the perimeter also. McCowan could have walked into the end zone. So much of quarterback play, everybody thinks, is throwing the passes, but a lot of it is proper ball handling. And some of the great quarterbacks we've seen are also big time ball handlers. Randy McCowan throws his first career touchdown pass as a quarterback for Texas A&M, and it's a big one. 59-0 is our score. More to come from Kyle Field in a moment. Marcus Woolridge and Mike Ellis back to receive a kick in their opportunity. Our Southwest Airlines game summary this afternoon looks like this. You can see USL not rushing the football with any success. Well, the coaches have got to be very happy on A&M with rushing for 218, but they also have got to be very happy with these numbers right here out of their two-quarterback system. That's almost dead even. You know, tough thing, too, for, for uh, USL, you can't turn the ball over seven times like that, yeah. and especially A&M, who's capitalized for 24 points on seven turnovers. Well, last year, the A&M defense 
Only accounted for seven of the USL points given up. Their offense gave up 22 points. Good opposite this year. And that's and that's a bad statistic. You know, when oh, yeah. you say your offense gave up 22 points, your defense wasn't even on the field. Pretty good hit put on uh, Baron Rogers. Glenn with a big hit, and he likes it. Let's listen in on this hit. This is called popping pads. Not oh. only do you hear the pop, you hear the air going. Oh, out. I Ooh. love that. Defensive coaches everywhere, <laughs> defensive players. You love it. You talk with your pads on defense. <laughs> you like that? That's, That's good. good stuff. Goldberg's going to keep it on their ground. Rogers going to give it another try, and he takes another lick. Michael Jamison may have rattled his own helmet. Baron Rogers is a tough cookie, though, to take two hits like that. Boy, we heard that one up here again. And we're about, what, a mile and a half up? <laughs> Listen in again. It's great. Well, the good news for Texas A&M on that is the fact that their players are still playing yeah. very hard. And some backup players are trying to prove a point that they are good, solid football players and can play with the first team. Third and four with 5.45 to play in the ball game. Rodgers has taken three hard hits in this drive. He'll be short of the first down. You know, we were talking about the defensive line of Texas A&M. They lost all three starters a year ago, and they went out and they recruited, Ron, seven freshman defensive linemen. And Bill Johnson, the defensive line coach, said, hey, they're a good group, but I don't know who's going to be a star. We think Edwards is going to be, but they've got seven young defensive linemen that are good football players in this A&M program right now. Chris Shaw back to kick it away. Pressure's put on, almost blocked. A line drive, and it will not be returned. Ball will be touched dead at the 29-yard line of Texas A&M. 4.58 to play, A&M on top. Texas A&M this afternoon, one minute and 24 seconds. With 4.58 to play, Brandon Stewart back in quarterback. They lead 59. Up. That's called explosion on offense. Oh, yeah. Quarterbacks have done extremely well for Texas A&M. Stewart hands it off to Rhodes. Well, the bad news this afternoon has nothing to do with the loss, but the loss of a player, Brandon Stokely, number 14 for USL on this play, right there. Well, he gets tangled up and he comes down on that left knee, and boy, that's that's just devastating not only to the US, USL's football team, but his dad, who's also the head football coach. On the day he becomes the school's all-time leading receiver, he quite possibly will be lost for the year. Well, Thad Hargan is in a quarterback now for Texas A&M. Looking for Matt Mahone, the junior out of Longville. Thad Hargan, a sophomore out of Crockett, Texas. You know, you know what Thad Hargan does during the games? He signals in the offensive plays that are given to him from Coach Marshall and Ray Dorr on the sideline. So he's a valuable part of this group, and he's going to end up being a coach someday because he always knows what's going right. on. But he signals in the plays from the sideline from the coaches to the quarterbacks. Well, Shane Leckler, the punter, was also part of this quarterback rotation, and he decided just to concentrate on punting, so Hargan has moved up to the number three spot. With 3.40 to play in the ball game, AM and keeps it on the ground. The ball is loose. Did the ground cause the fumble? Willie Terrell on the hit on Burnest Rose. Willie Terrell's having a big day. He's made a bunch of plays oh, yeah. for this USL defense. And, you know, he's a blitzing type of defensive back. And when he's around the football, something good happens. Well, the executive producers of Fox Sports Net are Arthur Smith and Bill Borson, coordinating producer of College Football Saturday, Roy Hamilton. Today's game has been produced by Robert Steinfeld and directed by Kenny, the wide receiver, Miller. Head of field operations is Andrea Jenkins. Leckler back to punt. I found it interesting that he and Stewart and Kyle Bryant all room together. That's That's got to be a piece of work. 
Well, it depends on what you define oh, as a piece of work. I'm not sure I want to go over there. Now, once again, I think A&M on their specialty teams, R.C. Slocum will not be pleased with it. A, a while ago, they only had nine guys. This time, they only had ten on the Well, field. what happens, though, Ron, when you have a lot of new players playing, backups on the special teams, 13 players on the special teams, they don't pay attention sometimes on the sidelines. And this is normal, but you know when you play Nebraska and you play Colorado, exactly. your first team special teams will take all the snaps. And there he is, R.C. Slocum on the sideline, yelling a little bit at his special well, teams coach. There's that rallying point that we talked about earlier. Uh, yes, the special teams coach, though, is his son, Sean Slocum. <laughs> He's not going to yell at him. Well, Leckler, 40 yards, 48 yards, and 31 yards on his three punts this afternoon. You know, with Leckler being an ex-quarterback, the amount of fakes and passes from punt formation that AM can use is, is, That's good know, point. is, is great. And they've got a couple things in. Now, they, they're not going to use it today, obviously, but to have a ex quarterback punter is really a weapon. Because other coaches know that, and it's always going to be in the back of their minds. Yeah, and plus, he's probably very athletic, exactly. you know, because he can avoid a rush and go down and make a pass. If he has to. Cornell Schumach. Leckler didn't like the way he kicked it. It's going to be short, but he gets a pretty good bounce. And it'll roll down, and they'll mark it dead at the nine-yard line. 61 yards on the kick. So Shane Leckler shook his head, but he got the benefit of the roll. But that has been the man right there this afternoon. That win. Oh, what a job he has done. Well, you know, he came into this game averaging... 10.4 tackles in every game that he has started was just a, it's just a fantastic number. But he has got a nose for the football. And it's hard to teach linebackers to run up the field and come under blockers and make plays in the backfield. But five tackles for losses today tells you this guy has got a great nose for football. And he is our Dr. Pepper player of the game, and for good reason. You know, he really does remind me of Mike Singletary. You know, in size, stature, demeanor, a quiet young man, but just plays with reckless abandon on the field and has a great smile. An American family early on when they first moved to the United States, and the mother said that that young man had a tape for him. He ate everything because he's a lot bigger than the rest of his family because he says he does nothing but eat. Southwestern Louisiana just keeping it on the ground here in the closing moments. Final 315 of the ball game. In case you just joined us, AM 45, nothing at halftime. They had an explosion from the get-go. You know, it's been tough sledding for uh, Southwest Louisiana. They they have been outscored so far this year, Ron, 193, including today's, to 34. Mm. And that's very, very tough. They've had tough opponents, you know, between Pitt and Oklahoma State and Texas Tech and now A&M, but they have just gotten rocked, 193 to 34. Not only have they played tough opponents, but you have to question, I think it's a legitimate question, the reasoning behind scheduling four opponents this difficult right in a row. Because in the past, they have not had that problem. They've played tough opponents. Like last year, they played eventual national champion Florida. But they had them throughout the schedule. They didn't have all four in a row. And that's the thing that the coaching staff was talking to me about, that they're beat up. Just like this last year, these are all good football teams right here. In fact, four of them went to bowl games, but they weren't in a row. These games this year were all in a row. And then at the end of the year, they play an outstanding Washington State team. Bumble A&M has got the football. They've got some end zone touchdown. Sean Corriet, the sophomore out of Sugarland, Texas. They say they want him a little more active, but I got a feeling that's about as active as they'd like to see. You know, he didn't start the first game of the year, but he ended up being the leading tackler on the team with 13 tackles. Today, he's made a bunch of big plays. Look for him to be in the starting lineup here before too long. Kyle Bryant with the extra point, and it is good. 2-12 to play in this ball game, and it won't come soon enough for USL. The football. 
Johnny Lucky on the spot. Sean Corriette picks it up and shows some fullback ability there by running over a would-be tackler. Nice job. And again, the guys in the film room are going to love that because when a defensive guy looks like a fullback running the ball, it always brings a lot of smiles to everybody's face, especially his. 19 yards on the return, and it's 66 to zip. Brian's going to have to ice down the leg after today. With the win, he gets every bit of that one. USL with 2.07 to play in the ball game. First and 10 from their own 20 yard line. You know, you look at AM's schedule, and R.C. Slocum said these first three games are like NFL preseason games to him. He wanted to come out of those games and say, where is my football team at? Because he knows when he goes up to Colorado on October 4th, he is going to be really, really tested. But these three games were preseason games to see where his team was at and what kind of football team he's got. Well, a and m still playing that attack defense that they wanted to play is James Clement on the carry. You know, being around this AM program for a couple of days, it's a breath of fresh air. In fact, R.C. Slocum last summer took his entire staff on a retreat and went through everything, Ron, from what you wear on the road to how you talk in meetings to players just to really fine-tune this program. He's got four new assistants, and he just thinks that it's a breath of fresh air in this A&M program right now. And I've got to agree with him because there's a lot of smiling faces and a lot of good football players running around this campus right now. Coming again. Got a moment. Like to thank Dan McDonald, the Sports Information Director at USL, and our good friend AC Alan Cannon here at Texas A&M, one of the best, for spending so much time with us the last couple of days. Here's a little closer look at RC Slocum, what he has done at home. Only four of those losses in the 90s. Top 10 record is the one that I think he probably looks at it and maybe cringes. You know, it's a great stat, though, this one right here, winning 12 or losing 12 of his 21 losses by seven points or less. In other words, he's been in the game each and every time. This man is an underrated head football coach. And like I said before, I think he's the best, quote, unknown coach in the United States. People in Texas know who he is because he's been around here for a long time. But this guy's a great coach. Domic has stood up and he almost had his head taken off. Final 30 seconds. Rocky Bernard was right there again. We've called his name a number of times this afternoon. I think Texas A&M came out today and has done what they wanted to do, Ron. They've established themselves. They've gotten better from the Sam Houston game to right now. This is a football team that's got a lot of young talent good new coaches and I think it's a team that's going to contend in the end for this Big 12 championship. Well you, the University of Southwestern Louisiana will not have to kick it away on fourth down and that's the way it ends. A&M defeats University of Southwestern Louisiana 66 nothing. Remember next week Dr. Pepper Big 12 game of the week the Colorado Buffaloes take on the Wyoming Cowboys. For Jim Knox and Artie Gigantino I'm Ron Thulin. Thanks for watching and so long everybody. Losses for this 1997 season, a 66 to nothing win over the University of Southwestern Louisiana, over 60,000 fans at Kyle Field after the game. I think the word I heard you use a lot was you like the team chemistry, like that, that sentence. Dave, you know, a lot's been said about the schedule and uh, about the early games. Uh, you know, we uh, have not played uh, two national powerhouses. I recognize that. But you're always looking in the early stages of the season at a team and how the, just how the team is developing. And uh, in the framework, how the players relate to each other, how the players relate to their coaches and the coaches to the players, how they get their business. And I feel good about this team, the way they're working to get better. And they're showing up on time for meetings. And they're doing all the little things that, that good teams do. And I, I, I really feel good about that. If the attitude's not there, I don't care who you're playing, it's going to be tough. Well, that's the most important thing. And if you don't have that, all those other things, you can have some talent and have a lot of things. But if you don't have that, you don't have a chance. And so I, I, I can say at this point in the season, I'm very pleased with the way these players have gone about their business.
Up next, we're going to have a look at the highlights of the USL game, and then right after that, Coach will have his comments on that game against the Rage and Cajuns. Right now, these messages. 1,000. After forcing a USL punt, the a and offense went to work. Brandon Stewart and Sir Parker connected on a 35-yard pass to the USL 12-yard line. Stewart rushed for the final yard to give the Aggies their initial score of the game. After the defense stopped USL again, the A&M offense took charge. Sir Parker took the ball on a 20-yard run into USL territory. Dante Hall contributed to the drive by taking it the final yard to give the Aggies a 14-0 lead. Warwick Holman and the wrecking crew continue to keep the USL offense in check and force the Ragin' Cajuns to once again punt the ball back to the Aggies. Sir Parker added to his 67 yards rushing on the day with a 12-yard run to the USL 41-yard line. Stewart went back to the air and completed a strike to sophomore Chris Cole for a 41-yard scoring play. Kyle Bryant's conversion completed the two-play, 53-yard drive and up the A&M lead to 21 to nothing. On USL's next possession, the Aggies garnered a couple of sacks. Mike Kazmierski sacked quarterback Brian Saunier for a two-yard loss. Chris Theory got into the act by forcing a fumble, which was recovered by Dat Wynn at the USL 31. Kyle Bryant's field goal as a result of the turnover took the Aggie lead to 24 points as the first quarter wound down. The A&M defense continued to pressure USL as they mounted a drive deep into Aggie territory. Trent Driver forced a ball loose from Elvis Joseph and recovered it at the 17-yard line. One possession later, Lance Domick was sacked by defensive lineman Zarek Rollins and Dat Wynn. Defensive back Cedric Curry took receiver Brandon Stokely down for a loss of two yards. Chris Shaw's punt was caused for some afternoon fireworks when all Dean Nimitz product Dante Hall took the punt 70 yards with some key blocks and evasive running along the way. Dante's run made the score 31 to nothing A&M. Another all Dean Nimitz product Jason Glenn made a fumble recovery to give the A&M offense another scoring opportunity. On first and goal from the eight, Tiki Hardeman took advantage of the scoring opportunity, taking it into the end zone. Kyle Bryant's extra point made the score 38 to nothing. Another defensive stop put the A&M offense on the attack again. Leroy Hodge took a pass from Randy McCowan to the 11-yard line. A McCowan keeper took the ball down to the two-yard line. True freshman Bernest Rhodes finished off the drive with a one-yard run. It's the Aggies 45 to nothing at halftime. The second half saw the Aggie defense continue to dominate, making big plays to maintain its shutout. On a fourth and one with USL threatening to score, Dad Wynn stopped Baron Rodgers for a four-yard loss to end the drive. The next series saw a sack by Chris Theory to set up an Aggie defensive stop on fourth and three. On the next USL series, Cedric Curry, the sophomore from Houston Sterling, grabbed his second interception in his many games, taking the ball down to the USL six-yard line. Stewart connected with Dan Campbell and a pass to the one, where Stewart then took it in for the score. The fourth quarter saw the Aggie defense continue to force turnovers. Sean Horn started the fourth quarter with a big play with a pickoff of a USL pass, returning it to the Aggie 29. Two series later, Rocky Bernard, a freshman from Baytown Sterling, forced a fumble, which was recovered by senior linebacker Trent Driver. The Aggies' Quinton Brown recovered a fumble on the next series, which set up the stage for the next score. Hardeman took the handoff from McCowan, 47 yards down to the USL 5-yard line. Dan Campbell got the score on a McCowan pass to up the lead to 59 to nothing. The wrecking crew finished off the scoring this day when Sean Coriant picked up a fumble and ran into the end zone to end the scoring and give the Aggies a 66 to nothing victory. Sell uh, 
the Aggies just took control from the opening kickoff and had it all the way to the end of the game. I was really concerned coming out about our focus, and uh, you like to start a game like this without giving the opponent any idea that they have a chance in the game. And to do that, you have to come out in all phases of the game and start off uh, on a positive note. And I was really pleased that we did that. Our defense came out and took control of the game early. Our offense took the ball, and I think it was the first four or five possessions we had that we went down and got points on the board. And then I thought our kicking games really throughout the day uh, we did some excellent things. We had a punt return for a touchdown. We had some great coverages on our kickoffs. We had uh, excellent coverage on our punt coverage. We had good protection for the punter. And really, uh, I thought that was one of the most significant things in the game. When you look at the, the way our kicking teams played and the coverage we got on the kicks, we, we looks like we're going to have a good group of, uh, of special teams this year. Last year, the composite uh, breakdown of the Big 12 stats, we led the Big 12 in the all factors, and I looked this week with the uh, various stats, Big 12 as well as national stats, and when you look at net punting, you look at kickoff return, punt return, uh, we're very high in all of those categories, and that's a, an extremely important part of your football team that is often overlooked, but it's something we spend a lot of time on, and uh, I think we're pretty good at it. Um, would the word confidence fit this team after two ball games? Are they playing with a lot of confidence? I think our confidence level is increasing each week, and uh, it's increasing from the standpoint of execution. And again, our players aren't uh, uh, lulled into thinking that they, you know, that they have played the best competition that they're going to see this year. We will definitely see best, better competition. This week, the team we play against North, uh, University of North Texas uh, will be a step up in competition. Uh, they, uh, they beat uh, Texas Tech last weekend. There's no fluke. They lined up and played us ball game and uh, took the breaks when they came and, and took advantage of them. So uh, our players understand that, but at the same time, when you're throwing and catching and you're blocking and you're, you're uh, executing your assignments on defense, there is a confidence that you develop that you can go out and play as a unit. And as the competition steps up, uh, it'll obviously be harder to make some of the plays but in terms of, of playing together, uh, I think our team is feeling better about uh, themselves, and, and that's positive. Are the Aggies on offense and defense in these first two games, have we made more big plays than, than we've seen in the past in, in any given game? I've said uh, several times that I think our offense is, has done a better job of, of mixing it up and executing that than we have uh, in a good while. Uh, we, we've been... Uh, I think unpredictable on when we're going to run. As far as this team's concerned, been a lot of talk, uh, Dave. First of all, about our quarterback position. Uh, we're playing two quarterbacks: uh, Brandon Stewart, uh, who returned from last year uh, as a starter, and Randy McCowan, who played last year a little bit for us. He was a young player and uh, made some progress through the spring and summer to the point that we feel good about both of these. I was asked a week ago about. Uh, what are the ups and downs of playing two quarterbacks? And I said, you know, I really can't think of a lot of downs other than you get asked a lot about the, the fact that you are playing two. But both of these young men have handled this situation very well. Uh, we have practiced them uh, uh, since spring training, throughout spring training, throughout the two days. And, and uh, they, I think it's a positive thing for us. And, uh, you know, the other day Brandon was hurt one time in the game, was hit and and was lying on the field and uh, actually just had to win, knocked out him a little bit. But at that time, that's when you, you say, you know, I'm glad we got someone else here that we've got some confidence in that can go in and play. And if you look at some of the teams around the country who have lost their quarterbacks and had to pull someone off the bench to, who was not experienced and went out and, and uh, was unable to perform, that, that's really unfair to the team. So I feel good about that. We do have at a number of other positions uh, competition going on. You look at the Will linebacker with uh, Trent Driver and Sean Corriott are having a good race there at that position and uh, there are a number of other positions like that. Our receiver positions are, are uh, being highly contested and I think that's good for your team. It's good because they push each other to get better. But it's also good that we've got a, a large number of our players who are getting the enjoyment of, of playing in the football game. And I'm very pleased with that. We've played a lot of players, and that's going to help us down the road from a depth standpoint. 
but it also helps us just from a strictly from a morale standpoint. We've got a lot of young men who have gone through two a days and gone through all the work and they're getting to play on the weekends, and, and I'm really happy. Grandma gets to see them play, and mother, and uh, so it's been a, and I think that's, without doubt, has helped our team and helped the just overall attitude on our team. Can we say, just uh, single out one group? I think they're receiving, the, the receiving core. Uh, what a job they've done. I, I've said that all along. Uh, they have been the most maligned group uh, all spring and all summer following last season, and uh, I'm pleased for them. They worked hard this spring, and uh, if, you know, Steve Craig Thorpe, the coach there, has done an excellent job with them, and uh, they're getting better. And I said all along, our receivers are going to be a, a positive, a strong uh, part of this football team. I'm going to have to ask you about North Texas when we come back. Okay. <laughs> all right, North Texas is the subject. That's the next game for the Aggies. Now these messages. Sign around your neck because you know, you've said this and you've said that. I told you so. I told you so. Uh, the uh, the Texas Tech University of North Texas game uh, shocker out in Lubbock, and it just goes to show you on any given weekend. Well, it probably shocked uh, just about everyone except Spike and his coaches. You know, he's been in this business a long time, and I, I guarantee you he knew before they played that game uh, from watching the University of North Texas on tape. Uh, he knew that they had a chance to to, to come in there and win, and. Uh, uh, you say it every week, and people say, yeah, Coach, okay, come on, you know, another one of those things. And so I am delighted that uh, the University of North Texas uh, this past weekend demonstrated uh, what I've said all along, that these teams, and you can see it all over the country, and I've said it many times, happens every weekend or so. And uh, uh, this team, they give scholarships. There are a lot of different ways that uh, different teams, because of schools, because of a lot of things, end up taking different players. Some teams take more junior college players. Some teams take more, uh, maybe more partial qualifiers. Some